That's a lie. Lying's a sin. Father Augustine, thank you for being on the show. Well, thank you, Matt Frad, <laughs> for having me on your show. I, I have a terrible thing. I have a thing about names because with my own, my own last name is Weta, <laughs> which it turns out is, in, is slightly insulting in Spanish. And and if you look it up on the Urban Dictionary, it's actually a racist word in some countries. So I keep track of other people's names, and I can't help thinking that your own name would be Fat Mad if you reverse the first two letters. I love doing that game. Me and the kids Fat do that Mad. all the time. I I grew up with a girl whose name backwards. <laughs> this is gonna be horrible. <laughs> whose name backwards was Anus Nose Rag. <laughs> <laughs> Sonia Garson. Shout out to Sonia Garson. You earned it. Sonia Garson and backwards is what? Anus nose oh rag. God, <laughs> 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 I like it. Okay, I need to. I, need to write I was warned, this down. by the way, that you were. I when I said I was coming on this show, my friends were all like, "Oh, he's going to make you curse." That's not so, true. That has so never happened. I, I, I'm going to try not to curse, but I always curse when I get excited. So right. I'm probably uh, likely to. Sonia curse. and then what? Garson. G A R S O N O N. And I apparently was the first one to notice that N nos rag. Anus. Anus, yeah. yeah. Anus nose rag. And and who is this woman in relation to you? Uh, my my father is an American historian. He was invited to England by okay. uh, <laughs> another historian named Bob Garson, whose daughter is Sonia, who I got to know while we were living in England, who now lives in okay. America. I was afraid and you were just going to say it was an old girlfriend, and that's how you broke up. Oh, no, no. I think I wanted to be her boyfriend, but it never worked out. Mm. So you're a Benedictine, mm -hmm. but when I think I am. of Benedictines, I think of Father um, Boniface. With the big beard? Well, the beard, but also the lack of whiteness. You, your, your habit's different. Explain. Yeah, every every English or every monastery has its own sort of set of historical traditions and things. So, for example, the English Benedictines, we have this weird floppy hood that makes us look like Darth Maul. You do. When you put, it's, it's only really cool when it's up. When it's down, it just looks kind of sloppy. <laughs> Um, but, uh, we, we don't tonsure because for hundreds of years, if you were caught with the tonsure, you were hanged, drawn and quartered. So they quit doing that. So out of respect for these guys who couldn't tonsure, we don't. Okay. But then also because they killed all the priests in England, the monks had to step up and basically we're a clerical order, which is why we don't wear a leather belt like Father Boniface would. Okay. Um... There's a third thing. Oh, we don't taunt. Yeah, we don't taunt your. Yeah, actually, interestingly, uh, even our up until 19, I think 87, it was actually illegal to dress as a Catholic cleric outdoors. Okay. And I believe it was. I, I could be <clears throat> totally slandering the British people here, but I'm pretty sure <laughs> all my British friends. Um, I. I'm pretty sure it was like 1987 when they finally repealed the law because the Pope came to visit England, mm -hmm. and he said, "I won't visit until you take that law off the books." It was a dead letter, but you know. So, so you're just so people are understanding. You're, you're a Roman Catholic. Oh yes, but in but in the what the Anglican tradition, okay. or is it? Well, no. See, what happened was Westminster Abbey was this great Benedictine house for many hundreds of years. And then Cromwell and his buddies decided to, to start killing Catholics and getting rid of the priests and monks. And there's one monk left from Westminster Abbey who escaped to Douay in France. Douay in France. Mm -hmm. If it's French, you have to mispronounce it on purpose you see, because you're English. Um, the and he his name was Sigibert Buckley. Speaking of strange names. And he clothed two novices who came back and founded Ampleforth, which then founded... <laughs> I'm still Louis. laughing about Anus <laughs> Nose Rag. Keep going. <laughs> yeah, it's it's, it's we're a, never going to get the, Yeah, no. it's fine. I, I, I was still thinking about it. But anyway, Nose quickly, Rag. though. So, yeah. Sum it up for me so I don't... Uh, I ADD. forgot what we were talking <laughs> yeah. about. Do, do you all celebrate, like, what... Do you celebrate the, the ordinary at Mass kind of oh, thing? Oh, no. no. I, okay, I, I'm just I'm, trying I'm to shooting understand. for it, though. Oh, yeah? I've already asked the abbot permission we're, we're, and the bishop permission. We're just waiting for... And they, they're open to that? <laughs> I don't know yet. I just asked permission. Okay. <laughs> and why but do you want to? We wanna... ought to do it because it's cool. Okay. And, did, and... You, did you write that down in an official letter? And... 
No, my my liturgical. I have a very sort of um, specific liturgical approach, which is if it looks cool, do it. Okay. I, I I've said before, and I tend to think like Gregorian chant and that kind of stuff, incense, ad orientum, that kind of thing. But if you can get me a really great mariachi band, I will say a mariachi mass. I just don't, or, or a gospel choir. I just don't think like. White people from West County, St. Louis, do gospel music very well. No, you know, so, I wouldn't imagine. But we're pretty good at chant. But isn't cool relative? You know, like back in the nineties, yeah, people were doing things that were horrific because they thought they were cool. Yeah, and that's okay. But they weren't really cool. See, so there's an the objective. St uh, yeah. I am <laughs> more or less. Okay. <laughs> but now history, history will tell you what's cool if it's been around. If it's been around for three hundred years, it's cool okay and well mariachi i guess hasn't been around for very long folk masses long. men yeah. with ponytails who no. play guitar no i get i i tell the kids well i used to be a, a lifeguard on the beach in galveston and the kids often ask me which is cooler which was cooler being a lifeguard or being a monk and i always tell them i'll, I'll answer any question I, I reserve the right not to answer a question Mm -hmm. But if I do, it'll be honest. And the truth is, it was way more cool being a, a lifeguard. It was really <laughs> more fun. But in my defense, there's nothing more depressing than a 30-year-old lifeguard, right? Is that and, right? I don't well, know. Well, the pony, the guy with the ponytail. Oh. oh, oh, oh. I told this joke. I was asked to speak at a youth conference, a youth minister's conference. I told this joke. How many youth ministers does it take to change a light bulb? I don't know. None. They wait 20 years till it burns out and then pretend like it's still working. <laughs> That's pretty good. Yeah. Pretty good. <laughs> horrible. Like yeah. It. They laughed, actually, uh, so I, maybe politely. Yeah. They didn't, they didn't hurt me, so. That's good. Figured that went, went as well as could be expected. When did you become a priest? Uh, 2002. I joined the monastery in 96. Okay. And then they sent me overseas I studied my heresy at Oxford and my orthodoxy at Kenrick Seminary in St. Louis. You studied your heresy? In well, I did theology. I got a theology degree from Oxford, but it was all sort of... Really? Yeah, it was pretty crazy stuff. Although I did take a patristics course from Tom Wynandy, who's a pretty neat guy. Don't they have good Dominicans over at Oxford? Yeah, he, he, was, well, he was one of the Dominicans. No, no, he's a Franciscan. He's one of the Grey Friars. Uh, but I remember I... I I, he taught me patristics, and I brought in a list of all the church fathers, all the good guys and the bad guys. And the good guys were in green on the right, the bad guys were in red on the left. And I couldn't figure out where to put origin, right? Because, yeah. like, where does he fit in? And he, le and it was our tutorial, and I was like, well, so, could you tell me, is, is origin a good guy? He, he said, give me that. And he looked at it, he tore it up, threw it in the trash, and he said, they're all good guys. They're all good guys. Until they disobey. Until then, they're just progressive thinkers. Okay. Yeah, and this, this uh, I, I, I quote that a lot because there are people with whom I vehemently disagree, but as long as they're obedient, I don't care. In fact, we had a monk who was very much in favor of women's ordination. In fact, he, he gave a, he was writing a book on it when JP2 came out with his statement. Mm. Said, and not only did he never talk about it again, he didn't even say, I'm not going to talk about it anymore. Hmm. He just threw away the manuscript, which had to hurt. Yeah. And he and I fought like dogs for a decade and a half. But when I, when I realized that, I thought, well, never mind. Yeah. He's a good guy. He's a good monk. Great monk, actually. How many monks do you have at your... Is it... Monastery, Abbey, what do you call it? Uh, monastery and <clears throat> Abbey. Uh, we have about 17, mm. including, I think, one at the South Pole. And We have 17 monasteries in total. No, no, monks. Oh, and one monastery. of them's at the South Pole. Yeah, and one of them yeah, is at the Falklands. And, the, oh, well, and then we helped refound Portsmouth Abbey, so we got five up there. Um, you know, it's hard to tell sometimes. They come and they go. You lose men in the field and... Why did you want to be a Benedictine? Uh, the habit, I guess. Yeah. The good artwork on the walls. My mother's an artist, and I just, um, I can't live with bad art. Yeah. Uh, and 
I, I visited a couple of religious communities in St. Louis, and <laughs> the Benedictines had the best art on the wall, so I guess that sort of decided it. Well, that was probably like an initial draw. I'm sure if they well, good art. Okay. Yeah. The initial draw, I was uh, I was working as an archaeologist in Rome, and every day I would take the bus from the Forum to the Vatican, and there are these pickpockets on the bus, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, you, I, have you, you look like the sort of person who's lived in Rome. I haven't lived in Rome, but I don't know what that means. You probably know a lot of it. Well, <laughs> I've anyway. been to Rome several times. Well, yeah. you know what to, when you see a pickpocket at work, you don't yell, hey, baby, baby there's a pickpocket, because then he gets real excited, might hurt somebody trying to get off. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. Okay. Well, good then, to know. There you go. Now you know. Yeah. And instead, what you do is you, you walk up next to him and you shove him. Okay. And that way they bump into the person they're trying to pickpocket, and that guy goes, oh, wait a second. And, and this and, is just common knowledge yeah. in the room. That's and what you so, do. And then he gets off at the next stop, and nobody gets hurt. Everybody's cool. So okay. I was on the bus, and there was a monk on the bus. And I was watching him because at that time I didn't even know monks existed. I thought they were sort of like up there with, I don't know, fairies and sprites and Eskimos mm -hmm. and imaginary people like that. Um and uh, anyway, so this um, pickpocket was trying to pick his pocket. And so I kind of settled up next to the pickpocket. I gave him a shove. And the monk was just oblivious. So uh, he I. Was, was he trying to pickpocket the monk? You no, know, the monk was trying to pickpocket him. No, yeah, yeah. He was <laughs> trying to pickpocket the monk, right? Okay. And so I shoved so you, him into the monk. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I can't. No, you're myself. good. Okay, good. Uh, and, and what did the monk do? Nothing. The monk didn't notice. So <laughs> the pickpocket goes at him again, and this time I showed him harder. And the monk still didn't. So I went to shove the the pickpocket a third time. Pickpocket looks at me like, just doing my job, you know. <laughs> yeah. So I tapped the monk on the shoulder and I said, "Scusi, questo è un borseggiatore." You know, this is. He goes, "Are you an American?" I was like, "Yeah." He's like, "Me too." I was like, "Really?" I was like, "Well, this guy's trying to pick your pocket," and he goes. Yeah, I know, but I don't have any pockets, so I thought it was funny. <laughs> <laughs> and so that was my first experience of the Benedictines. Yeah. And I thought to myself, there's like a... Th these guys have an edge that I want, you yeah. know? I mean, I've got lots of stories yeah. like that, because he, he invited me to his monastery, and there are all kinds of cool guys there, and I just... I, 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 Okay, well, then comes the second story, which is, uh, this must be a conversation, right? So I shouldn't spend too much time. No, this is fine. Okay. I'm liking it, yeah. Well, uh, it's in the book, actually. <coughs> which um, book? The Humility Book. I'm, I'm an expert on Isn't humility. Isn't nice when you've written a bunch of books and people have to ask which book? Yeah, it, it is great. increases the humility. I, I always thought to myself, when I was in college, I remember thinking <clears> to myself, you know, if it weren't for women, I would learn another language, write some books, get some extra degrees. And I was totally right. Like, oh, okay. yeah. Um, <laughs> that happened. Yeah, yeah. yeah. As soon as I gave up women, all of a sudden I had all the spare time on my hands. Um, yeah, but hey, yeah, so I, I've written this. So don't talk to me about humility, okay? Because I've written right. the book on humility. Um, well, I haven't. I need to know about it at well, some point. Well, yes, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm an expert, I can tell you. Yeah. Um, Oh, uh, I totally forgot what we were uh, talking pick, about. Second monk, I think the second story. So the first oh, monk. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, so he got me. I, I I finished working as an archaeologist, right? And then I wanted to stay on in Rome. So he got me a job at Santa Selma, which is on the Aventine Hill, as a janitor. Mm -hmm. And uh, about once a week in Rome, all the lights go out okay. for a couple of hours because the electric company is you know is run by Italians. <laughs> And so all the lights went out for like three hours. And when they came back on, there was this old Trappist stuck in the elevator. And being the janitor, I had to get him out. So I pried open the doors and I'm sweating and there's grease everywhere. I pull this guy out and I wasn't in a very good mood, but he was just beaming. Really? Yeah. And I looked at him and I said, what's your problem? Uh, which wasn't a very nice thing to say, actually. Mm. In Come to think of it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> But, uh, and he said, problem, he, he said, I just got to spend three and a half hours in an elevator, and he walked off, and and I found him later, and I was like, what? And, and he said, well, look, here, I, I've, I gave up everything so I could pursue a life of contemplation, right? And now I have filled it with things to do, lectures and books and articles and things, 
And he says, he, there I was in the elevator. He said, I couldn't see anything, couldn't hear anything, couldn't talk to anyone. He's like, it was beautiful. I just sat there and I prayed and I prayed. Wow. And I went back to my room that night and I wrote in my journal, like, I could never be a monk, but there's a power there that I want, hmm. right? I mean, like the next time I'm stuck in traffic, like I'm going to be like, oh, what a great opportunity, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and doesn't Catholicism in general have that ability to turn these horrible experiences into beautiful moments to draw closer to Jesus? Uh, yeah, I know what it's like when you're sitting in a traffic light and I'm frustrated because I, I just missed the, the yellow yeah. light and I've got to sit there. Oh, I hate that. And then I think to myself, would I be happier if I were over there? And of course I think yes, but I, <laughs> I, know, I, I know deep down that I wouldn't be. It'd be exactly the same. But so it's all more these... than that. It's like the the very frustration is saving the world, right? And Jesus, mm. St. Paul has that passage about you make up what is lacking in the sufferings of Christ. Mm. With our suffering, so every every opportunity to suffer is like, oh, great! Yeah, you know? yeah. I think that's I think that's good. I think um, one of the things Therese of Lisieux has taught the church or yeah. reminded the church is that our sufferings don't have to be anything to brag about in order for them to still be things we can offer to the Lord. Because I often think my things, my mm. problems, my issues, my health concerns, financial yeah. stuff, whatever. It's like that's not that's not what he meant. Or even in First Peter five seven, where he says, "Cast all your anxieties." I'm like, he can't mean this. Yeah. Like, he can't mean irritable bowel syndrome, can he? Yeah, yeah. But he well, does. I, okay, yes. Well, actually, last... Okay. <laughs> here irritable we go, bowel syndrome. Here we go. Well, last Christmas... Okay, I, I'm not a big fan of kids. It's one of the proofs of my vocation. I don't find them interesting. Okay. They, in fact, they creep me out. They're always sort of watching you. Uh -huh. Terrible hygiene, bad <laughs> conversationalists, ill-educated, right? So the taste I don't, of music is the worst. Oh, yeah. I mean, and... and the conversation is so boring. I I had a whole like hour and a half with my niece Georgia and the only thing she said was fork the whole time. Just the same word. It was awful. Um but I can kinda handle her in limited doses. So okay. it was Christmas and we were playing with American girl dolls. You like, and Georgia? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And for the record, I can't imagine any activity less enriching than having <laughs> fake tea with a fake person at a fake cafe, right? Yeah. And, and and at that the service was terrible besides, right? Yeah. And then so you got your prostate check one day and you're like, actually, that's I think that was better. <laughs> yeah. Uh yeah. I'm gonna leave prostates out of that's this. That's a good idea. Story. Let's continue. <laughs> American girl dolls. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the two just don't know. Don't. Let's just keep moving. No one's um, had that conversation anyway. <laughs> in the history of humanity in any sense. Yeah. Well, the, another <clears throat> first on the Matt Fradge, on the mm -hmm. Fat Mad Show. <laughs> yeah. um, American Girl Dolls. Girl Dolls. You playing with Georgia. Boy, the way you said that. Um, no, I didn't say. You said Girl Dolls, to be clear. I said American Girl Dolls. American Girl yeah. Dolls. Okay. Hey, oh, this, this is going is great. No, this is never going to work. I'm going to be in so much trouble when I get At home. any point you want to just pull the ripcord, yeah. we can go I'm have out. a drink. I'm out. <laughs> um, anyway, so we're playing it with American Girl Dolls, and I had to think of an excuse to leave. So I said, I've got to go to the restroom. And she said, oh, are you going to poop? <laughs> And which is exactly why I don't like children, right? And I, I think well, they read your soul, is right? That it? Yeah. yeah. So okay. I no, said, you... you know, it could, it's a possibility. <laughs> you know, I don't know. And she said, well, it's going to be stinky. Yeah. I said, well, thank you for that warning. And I went off. Came back a few minutes later, and she's standing there. She's got two American Girl dolls by the hair, and she's looking out the window. And I said, Georgia. She's like, yeah. I'm like, are you okay? She goes. Gussie? And by the way, there's only one person in the world who is allowed to call me Gussie. Actually, four. My three, nurse, <laughs> my three nieces and their best friend, uh, oh, I, Gigi. They are allowed, all four of them are allowed to call me Gussie. But anyway, she says, Gussie, did Jesus poop? And, and I, I had never actually really thought of that before, yeah. but I said, yeah, yeah, he did. She goes, cool. <laughs> And she went running around the house proclaiming, you know, the good news. And this it, is what she learned from her Benedictine uncle. Yes, yeah. I'm well, sure it, the parents were thrilled. She proselytized at Mass the next Sunday. She went up in communion. She got to the front and said, putting her arms like this. She went, 
Jesus poops. She did not. Yeah, she did. She told everybody leaving church that day. Yeah. But but I think this was a moment of revelation for me too because yeah, why why should that be something that's beyond uh, that's taboo? I mean, well, Jesus I poops. No, I get to, and and well, okay. we'll, we'll get, we'll, you just wait here. <laughs> Who's <laughs> showing us this anyway? Right, huh? Keep going. Keep going. Uh, well, I mean, St. Paul says everything you do. Do for the glory of God. <laughs> okay. Right? And and George is really only good at that one thing, right? So why shouldn't why uh, we can eat Cheerios for the glory of God and even do we even yeah. even poop, poop for the glory? I mean, why not? Yeah. And that's the point well, it's not the whole point, but it's part of the point of the incarnation is that all of creation is infused with 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 divine dignity. Go ahead, sorry. I, no, it's good. I think um who is this, by the way? Which oh. one? Oh, don't touch it. It'll oh. fall out. That's uh, Thomas Aquinas, uh, really? first class relic. Yeah. <laughs> somebody, I, I, sorry, I hate to tell you, somebody stole. Is that his no? It's, it's it's underneath. It's oh, underneath. You have okay. to pull it out. And it's there. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Breathe into hey, this. You, you were saying back to pooping. Hey. I, yeah, back to pooping. I, I Everything agree. always ends up with poop. I agree with you, and I don't agree with you. I think no. Here's why. Yes? I don't, here's well. Here's why I think. Why should it be taboo? Because pooping should be taboo. Like it isn't something that we should just talk openly about, especially not about our our Lord. I think. And I got a reason okay, for it. Okay, why not? But I also agree yeah. with you in a sense. So I want to get to that okay. too before you hammer me. I, I think there are activities that we share in common with the beasts that we seek to elevate. And we seek to okay. hide and not talk okay. about. And there's a good reason we don't talk about it. Because when we talk about it, we tear ah. down orally, verbally, what ought to be hidden, elevated because of our yeah. dignity. Right, like if you... Well, that's, isn't so that's that one, Don Eden's complaint with Christopher West? I don't know. Is that he takes sex and sort of... Elevates it beyond what it, I mean. I no, but I'm saying I the opposite. I teach problem. Christopher I'm West saying the opposite in my problem. Class. I'm saying oh. we're not elevating. We're we're kind of reducing us in in using that kind of comp the language. Here's an example. Or, like if, or, if, yeah. I'm trying to think. If someone invited you over to their house and you were out in the backyard having a sure. barbecue, and they invited their child just to, he needed to go, he said, like, "Just just yeah. dump there." There's, ah. some, there's something shameful about that. He sh he's not yeah. a good father because this act ought to be hidden. Right? Yeah. To protect their dignity. So Except I, as an American, right. I feel obliged to announce before I go to the, right? <laughs> so that's I how, At Oxford, they were always saying, how come Americans always announce before they shower mm. and before they use the restroom? We've and never, I, I, it's, it's funny, I don't know. Isn't that interesting? I, I never, I've never But done we that. always do. It's like, well, yeah. guys, I got to take <laughs> a shower. Or, I, I, or, I want to agree with uh, you. Uh, here's how I agree with you. <laughs> okay, you know, I actually, good, I actually you. think there is some like theological kind of insight to garner from that. You know, the idea that this. I mean, again, I can't. I can't insight agree with you garner? and say it out. What? Sorry, never mind. I, probably my accent. Yeah. That, that our Lord was fully human. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And so, so reminding ourselves of just what that means is probably a way of getting at some point, I guess. But but I don't know I I don't well, know about I think I would have been maybe, a lot more comfortable ten years ago to talking like that but I don't know if I would today. Well maybe maybe or the, maybe it's specific circles that it would be appropriate in but. Yeah I I know I told that story to the Nashville Dominicans <laughs> and about half of them were thrilled and half of them were like deeply disappointed in me. So how do you deal with that? Giving a talk to straight eyes. I'll nuns. tell you yeah it, and to make it worse it was the feast day of Saint Peter Damien. And they wanted me to preach on St. Peter Damien. I was like, I don't know anything about I don't even know who he was. But first, a but story I'll tell about, you about my niece, Georgia. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you about Takayama Yukon, the samurai saint, right? And then they, we had the readings at meals, the, the martyrology. Yeah. This is St. Peter Damien, doctor of the church and Benedictine monk. And you have not you have not been humiliated until 700 fully habited nuns <laughs> laugh at you. <laughs> like, he's a monk. I should have known. Ah. But, Do you anyway. know the patron saint of bowel movements is St. Bonaventure? Is that really a, a subject a we should be discussing? I think yeah. you've already opened <laughs> it up. So I'm only <laughs> following in Why your train. Is he, oh, because his guts were pulled out and wrapped around a tree? Bonaventure? No, I don't know. Oh, no, no, that one Bonaventure. No. I don't know why. I don't know how <laughs> these people get their different uh the different things attributed to them. I suppose it's from the laity. Right? It's not like the Pope says we're gonna canonize this saint, <laughs> right. and by the way, he'll be the patron saint, saint of, of bowel movements, which is yeah. quite embarrassing because he died he died the same year as Aquinas, Franciscan oh. versus Dominican, both doctors of the church. Thomas is the patron saint of universities. 
Bonaventure? Is that the Bonaventure is the patron saint of bowel disorders. As ah. it is bowel disorders. Yeah. Thank you. As it is Thank believed you for the big difference. that Huge his difference. childhood illness that nearly took his life was a bowel disorder. Okay. Oh, okay. So speaking of saints with their different... Oh, uh, yeah. Can we get to that? You, oh, yeah, you have definitely. a plethora of saint prayer cards. I do. And a shout out to Sister Liguri, who I'm sure is dead by now, but she used to... <laughs> and if she's sorry, alive, I doubt she's watching shout this. shout up to Sister Liguri, uh, who was a Dominican nun who used to hand out holy cards of the saints to people who did well in her class. And now that I'm a teacher, I hand out holy cards too. Okay. But I work at a boys' school, so fluffy lamb Jesus is just not going to... No. Cut the mustard. So tell us what we got here. Um, well, we've Teach got. Me. I've got. Uh, What's this one? Oh. Let's see. Uh, Saint Dunstan, the jailer of demons. All right. What does this mean? We're going to go through them slowly. I need to understand. Saint D Dunstan. 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 Well, Dunstan. some of them are in Latin because okay. Latin is cool. Yeah. Um, and uh, and what's he doing here? He's got the devil by a by the nose. He, okay, so it was nighttime and greater silence had been called, and he was trying to make a chalice. He was, uh, what do you? Roasting a child? <laughs> How do you? What do they call I'm it? I'm not even going to try. I'm just going to let you keep going. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. you don't roast a chalice. Nah, I mean, he's he, he was, he's a jewelry sure. maker. So yeah. It involved fire. Yeah, he's boiling and the chalice. Yeah. Boiling yeah. it, 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 melting it's, it or something. Yeah, smelting it right. or something. Or yeah. Anyway, <laughs> anyway um, so the devil appeared to him and tried to tempt him. And he took the hot tongs out of the fire and grabbed the demon by the nose. All right. But because it was greater silence and he was a good monk, he couldn't say the exorcism. So he held it there until morning, until the bell rang, and then he exorcised it, told it never to come back. Okay. So the icon is of him holding a demon by the nose. We'll put that uh, up. we we got to yeah, put these up in the thing. Me. This is... Same to you after. As you edit it, put them in. If, if yeah. anyone out there ever visits St. Louis, I'll give you one. Uh, the Saint one? Drogo, Saint the Drogo. patron saint of ugly people, and you He's, gave that to me this morning. I, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, well, you, you can give it to an ugly friend, perhaps. Um, yeah. But he's, you, he's It doesn't say it should say patron saint of ugly people. I think it says patron saint of the unsightly. Maybe Does it? intercede hey. for us that we uh, may have patience in suffering when overlooked and exhausted, when plagued by guilt or regret, when burdened by feelings of ugliness or abandonment. That's right. good. Well, he's also the patron saint of intestinal blockages, kidney stones, mental illness, uh, and coffee. Really? Yeah. Ugly people and coffee. And and kidney stones. Yeah. He, he's a great one. And, and they, they wouldn't allow him in the church because he scared the kids. So he would... <laughs> <laughs> so he built a little shack next to the church and drilled a hole in the wall and would watch mass. That's not creepy. And even today in Sabor, he would watch his sheep and watch what? mass at the same time. <laughs> so he was cross-eyed. Well, he, he bilocated. Oh, well, that's better. Yeah. yeah. That, well, we, so, the church won't marry you if you're bilocated, but <laughs> uh, bad joke. Anyway, the point is that he even today in Sabor, they say, I'm not saying Drogo. I can't do everything. Okay, and where is where's that? Where's he from? What country? France. I think and, Alsace, actually. And the the story of him being ugly is it just that one that you told that he was he would frighten the children? Is that all we know about him? Or um, he he okay he grew up with guilt about killing his mother because he killed his mother when he was born. Oh, and something there's something tricky with the birth and maybe his head got oh. misshapen and stuff. Yeah. Wow. Anyway, but okay. He's That's a saint, saint, so who cares? Saint Drogo. Um, saint Takayama Uka, the is samurai. Super metal. Yeah, yeah. He was. He's. I really believe there should be more samurais in the church's calendar. Again, because it's cool. Because it's cool. Absolutely. He was. He ran around Japan killing anyone who wouldn't convert. And the Jesuits, well, the Jesuits caught up to him and said, we don't do it that way. So he said, We Fine. appreciate your enthusiasm, and, yeah, we appreciate but we're really going to need to dial yeah, it the, back. Got, so he took his sword and he hung it up on the wall and he said, hereafter, I fight not with the words of our Lord. No, I fight not with the katana, but with the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. All right. Which turned out to be less effective because his <laughs> buddies killed him. But, but the, the Jesuits were behind him as he said that. Yeah, like, That's great. Thank he you has so that much. in common with Olav the Fat, who I Who's don't that? have a holy card for him yet, but I'm yeah. going to make one. He was a Viking, and uh, he told his friends, I'm a Christian now. And they said, so what does that mean? He said, well, that means turning the other cheek. 
So they killed him and took all his stuff. Yeah. <laughs> that's how he Because apparently being a Viking and being a Christian don't, you know, yeah, drinking right. meat out of the skulls of your enemies and being a Christian don't quite meld yeah. or mesh. Is this the only, um, um, uh, what? What's the name of these things again? Sorry. I, Holy card. I, no, no. You didn't grow up with those? No, of course not. Samurai. Sorry, the name oh, escaped samurai, me. Samurai, yeah. I, I was trying, I, as I was saying, the ninjas are the bad guys. Samurais are the good guys. Isn't that the... Yeah. So is well, it, these ninjas the only... never really existed. I mean, they. I don't think... Mm, some, were, you used to think monks didn't exist, though, so who knows? Why would I tell this? It's too late now. We're, we're going through you. the different... Oh, yeah. We're going through different saints. So one was the fat. Yeah, except that I was just going to say that I, um, I have this great friend who's a fundamentalist Muslim extremist. Ah. Yeah, we have a podcast together. I'll tell you all about that later. Um, but... He he told me he gave me a great a great quote from the Quran that I that I used for now. He said, "Where there is no shame, there is no honor." I just think it's really okay. cool. Yeah, All right. because we're a shameless society now, or at least we're oh, working there, our way. There is no shame. Where there, there is oh, no where? shame, there oh. is no honor. Yeah, yeah, that's so good because they're two sides of the same coin, aren't they? Right, yeah. right. Well, I was giving this talk to these homeschool associates who said. As Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, oh. and again, it went over like you know, like a lead balloon. No, that's I, good. It should have. Yeah, yeah. Well, it should have. Yeah, yeah, I know. And I, I just didn't <laughs> read my audience. So I just go, well, hey, even a blind hog finds an acorn every now and then, huh? Yeah. And I thought, oh, my God. Now I just compared Muhammad. To, uh, <laughs> can we please erase the last minute and a half of my talk and just pretend it didn't happen? Um yeah, but uh, but I'm such a fan of Takayama that I actually built my own set from scratch of samurai armor. R I'll send what? you a picture. Yeah, I well that's partly the Parkinson's, but they, they gave me this medication. Yeah. <laughs> that and after a year and a half on this, it's called Mirapex. And after because uh, I've I played 18 years of rugby, so okay. I, I have brain damage. In case you couldn't tell, and I have to take these pills every now and then. One of which I'll take right now. Um, is that so? No, tell us about that. You you played rugby in high school and college, or I played uh, well. I I, sw I played water polo in high school, and then I joined the the Co Rice University water polo team. But they mm -hmm. practiced too much, so I joined the lacrosse team. Mm -hmm. But that was too difficult to keep the little ball in the hole, so I just decided to hit people. Mm. So I played for Rice University, and then when I became a monk, they sent me to Oxford. And I don't drink, and I don't really smoke. Sorry, I, I was. I okay. hear that you do a lot of that here, um, which is fine, by the way. No, <laughs> I'm not judging. And why would I? It's great stuff. Um, but uh, yeah, I've totally lost track of my. Uh, so you got brain damage? Oh yeah. Did you really so, get brain damage? Yeah, yeah. What, I mean, what, what I happened? got like nine or ten concussions. I've broken pretty much every bone, or a bone in every part of my body. I can, really? I, yeah, my nose six times. Your nose looks good having been broken. I know. Many times. I broke it so often that it's sort of Kept rubbery now and okay. it just is straight. Yeah, I, I would walk into the <clears throat> emergency room at Oxford and the doctor would just walk out, oh my push it back into shape, and walk out. Um, but I guess this drug they put me on. After I'm on it for a year and a half, they're like, Have you experienced any kind of compulsive behavior? I'm like, like What? They're like, Hiring prostitutes, <laughs> pornography, gambling. I'm like, you know what I do? Like, and I said, no, but I've been making armor. And they were like, we don't think that counts. You know? And then I showed them a picture. They're like, oh, my God, we need to reduce your dosage. Because I built this out of refrigerator parts, shoe leather, uh, candlesticks, I, I'll put a picture so of it you on your take, website. Uh, do you take, uh, is it like hyperfrontality? Is it something with your frontal lobes that you're taking medicine that's... Uh, mm, mm. No. Uh, Mirapex is what they call a dopamine agonist. Right. And what happens with Parkinson's is the little dopamine yeah, receptors that's right. You take a die. derivative of dopamine to right. help you. So yeah. if you crank up the dopamine, all right. of a sudden things that that's right. release it become yes, yes, yes. twice as compelling. So yes. I made samurai armor, I made Viking armor, I made Roman armor, Greek armor. Uh, Does it look good? Say, oh, can, uh, well, it, when we edit this, we'll post yeah, the pictures online. I'll show you a picture later. Yeah. But yeah, it looks good. Wow. I, I made them based on museum replicas did you have any experience of that in your no 
No. How and, did you learn how to make Viking armor? And I just samurai. Uh, YouTube kind of. They, they, yeah. I guess there are channels probably that. Well, the interesting thing <laughs> is, at the same time I was doing this, there was some guy in Philadelphia who just suddenly started making saltwater aquariums. <laughs> okay. So apparently it's not limited just to <laughs> prostitutes and gambling. Thanks be to God. Um, saltwater. I can't Can you guys finish the holy cards? Oh, yeah, the holy so cards. So I have this as a clip. Thanks. Thursday's great. He's even... Uh, I, I see why he's here. Uh, okay, so this is... Uh, St. Peter of Verona, patron saint of having a terrible day. <laughs> that is not. That is not. <laughs> he Wait, is. Okay, tell us about him. Well, Peter I don't know Verona. anything about him. All I know is this icon, and he just has this look on his face. He's like, well, that didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> he's got a sword in his head and a knife in his chest, and he's just like, well, darn no, it. he is holding lilies. Yeah, he is. So he's still really looking, trying to look on the bright side. Yeah, but he's going like... <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see... Uh, oh, Andreas. Is he really the patron saint of having a terrible day? Or is that just well, your you, joke? Look, you yourself said this This originated with yeah, the laity, remember. right? Yeah, yeah. So it's originating with me. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. I don't mind. Someone's got to be the patron saint of a bad day. <laughs> that's right? a date, hey? And patron it doesn't saint. get much worse than this, let me tell you. I mean, yeah, that's, that's pretty bad. Yeah. Um, He's a 13th century Catholic priest. Oh, oh, and the worst part is the guy who put this, the machete in his head sure. was canonized. Come on. To add insult to injury, <laughs> literally. Yeah. Yeah. He was canonized. And both yeah. of them were canonized. Presumably he repented. So originally. one saint took a machete to another saint's head. Yeah, I don't think he was a saint when no, he did it. I'd say not. <laughs> no, probably not. Yeah. Wild, man. Yeah. All right. Uh, Andreas Wouters, one of my personal Kinda favorites. Kind of looks like Luther. Yeah, he does, doesn't he? A little bit. He, um, uh, he was a Catholic priest in Holland in the 13, 1400s. Uh, no, it had to be later. Well, anyway, they, when they became Protestant, they rounded up all the priests and put them on trial. And they didn't bother looking for Andreas because they figured, well, he's a sellout, right? And so he showed up at the trial anyway. Yeah. And the judge was so aghast at this, he said... Uh, You've been a whore your whole life. <laughs> Why start now? And he turned to the jury, and he said, and the quote is on my little holy card at the bottom. It says, he said, uh, a, a whore I have always been. A heretic I will never be. So they I can relate to with that. the rest. Finally, a saint that yep. we can relate to. That's beautiful. Uh, oh, you might be able to relate to Gabriel Pocenti. Let's see. He's a sort of baby face <laughs> guy. Low self-esteem. Yeah. Took up... No, that <laughs> yeah. one. No, that's <laughs> I'm getting that. Oh, I'll get to the part okay. you can relate to. Yeah. Sorry. That's all right. Uh, Ran a podcast. What? <laughs> yeah. Well, he took up dueling, and he okay. became this crack shot. Okay. And uh, then he got real, real sick and made a vow to Our Lady he'd become a priest if she cured him, which she did. Mm -hmm. And then he took back the vow. So ah. he got sick again, so he made the vow again. He, and was, in, he, he was dueling as a priest, or...? No he, no, he vowed to become a priest if she cured him. Oh, cured him, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, he got sick. But what was the vow? The vow was to become a priest. And then did he leave the priesthood? You no, he never did join the seminary at all. He was just like, oh, well, I'm better now. It's like, it's like my, totally. my, I had a roommate in college who's an atheist who was like, I prayed for a parking space on the way here. And when I got there, wow, there it was. I thought, why did I waste all that time praying, right? When it was yep. there all along. The old joke. Um, so anyway. He's a look. <laughs> Uh, so anyway, he did this three times. Finally, wow. on the third time, she appeared to him and said, I'm not fixing you unless you definitely get in the seminary. He said, fine. So he joined the Passionists. <laughs> and then there was the... This is amazing. There was some sort of civil war, I guess, in Italy between the socialists and the monarchists or something. I don't even... I don't know the different details. The point is... Bad guys, a whole bunch of them, yeah. were in his little village and were burning things and stealing things. And they dragged this girl out into the piazza. And he ran out and he grabbed the girl and he wrestled the revolver away from the commanding officer and said, I'll shoot the next guy who touches her. Mm -hmm. And one of the soldiers said, well, there's only six bullets in that gun and there are 300 of us. So he turned around and he shot a lizard off of the wall. He said, now there are only five bullets in this gun. <laughs> But so five they, of you were going to die. they moved yeah. on okay. <laughs> to the next village, which right. presumably they destroyed. Um, <laughs> what else have we got? <laughs> so he's the patron saint of the NRA, actually, but don't tell anybody that. 
Don't you tell anyone. It. We want to say um, a thing. Uh, Theodorus <clears throat> Tyro. All right. He, he, I was giving a retreat in Bremerton, Washington. When this fellow walks up, he's got these big muscly dude with a handlebar mustache. Looked like one of those strong men from the yeah, circus, yeah. old time circus. Mm -hmm. It turned out he had been special forces in the in the Navy. And he says, I got a, a great saint for you. He's a patron saint of interreligious dialogue. And he told me the story of St. Theodorus, which is that he became a soldier in, I think, the 3rd century A.D. Mm -hmm. And um, Christianity hadn't yet sort of taken root. So he, let's see, he joined the army. And apparently he was so good, even as just a new recruit, like they, they were ambushed by, I think, Scythians and he killed like 30 of them. And so they just, they gave him the nickname, the new guy, <laughs> the recruit, like that's the recruit, Tyro yeah. in Latin. Okay. Um, so then he converts to Christianity, but they, they had this thing where they had to sacrifice at the temple of Diana every year. So he tells his friends, I'm not doing it. I'm a Christian now. Yep. And his buddies knew that... <laughs> If he said he wasn't doing something, he darn well wasn't doing it. So they went to their legionary, and he said, okay, look, just have him walk past the temple. We'll all just assume that you offered the sacrifice. Hint, hint, right? Yeah. So he walked past the temple. On his way back, he <clears throat> burned it to the ground. Wow. Yeah. So Interreligious dialogue. Yeah, well, well, no, what makes him the patron saint of interreligious dialogue is that his buddies were like, well, we, now we have to kill you. And he's like, I understand. You've got your beliefs, I have mine. You've got to kill me now. And they all parted as friends. So nobody compromised on their beliefs, and they all ended happily ever after, more or less. Have you heard of St. Vitalis of Gaza? No. So he's an Orthodox saint, Vitalis. patron saint of prostitutes and day laborers. You're going to like oh, this. Oh, okay. So Vitalis, he's in. Uh, next time I see you, I will have a... Yeah, V I T A L I S of Gaza, G A Z A. And of hair cream, right? I don't know about that. Is there a hair cream called Vitalis? Uh, there will be <laughs> after your prayer cards catch on. Yeah. Um, so he would hire himself out as a day laborer, uh, even as a monk, and each day would take his money to a different prostitute and pray the Psalms oh. as she <laughs> close. <laughs> <laughs> so as she so she wouldn't have to she wouldn't have to fornicate that night. Isn't that wild? Wow. Wow. I heard a wonder, uh, a little story from. Have you ever run into the little brothers and sisters of Jesus? They're affectionately known in among religious as the sand people because oh, they yeah. wear these. Do you, you think you know what I'm talking about? Have, they have a scapula. Yes, they're like trying yeah, to bring yeah. all of them together with Franciscans and with Carmelites. And yeah, with, yeah, yeah, yes, is those guys. Yeah, yeah. They, they look like cool. sand people. They yeah. Look, yeah. Um, from Star Wars. Um, and, and, well, anyway, they told me this story that their founder told a story about a prostitute who had this conversion mm -hmm. and she was really beautiful. And what she would do is she'd go out on the street and seduce men, oh. bring them into the house of prostitution, through it, deposit them in the chapel, and then take <laughs> off. <laughs> and, huh. and it was her beauty that brought all these men to Christ, you Interesting. see. Interesting. Yeah, which is why they wear this elaborate habit. And Interesting. Yeah, why beauty you, You've is obviously so heard of Mary of Egypt. Yes. Yeah. The, the desert mother. Who was at one time a prostitute, but not just a prostitute, but she would even not charge the men. She said to... Stood for fun. She said, I had an irrepressible desire to lie in filth. Ooh. So there's a... I think that's a good story for mm. women who have bought into the sort of feminist lie that they can fornicate <sighs> and be liberated. Yeah. And this they have all this shame. You know, like these women, they're not even charging to act this way. Yeah. And so here's Mary of Egypt is a beautiful example of. Yeah, my friend Umar, who I quote all the time, is he said, you know, women used to be the, the, the bastions of morality. They were the keepers of the keys. Like they held the real power in the relationship and they gave it all up. I don't know. I, I, I don't know if that's true I, or not, but yeah, I don't know whether men are going to have to be certainly... virtuous, independent of the women they spend time yeah. with. Yeah. Who's this fellow you said you quote all the time, Omar? Oh, yeah, U Umar. Um, well, the, the, what happened was, I don't know, a couple of years ago, they decided, Black Lives Matter decided they were going to tear down the statue of St. Louis in St. Louis. And um, when Ferguson hit, I decided a monk needed to be in the middle of it. And to give you a sense of how accurate the news is, 
they said that St. Louis is on fire, mm-hmm. right? So I got in a car and I went looking for the bar- riots, and I couldn't find them, um, which <laughs> is just as well because I didn't ask permission and I should have been there anyway. But this time I asked the abbot permission to go, and he said, yeah, but monks, de- there's actually a part in the rule that says that you never defend a brother, <laughs> that he, you never get involved in someone else's argument because you can never really know what's going on. So he said, you can pray, but if things get dicey, you got to back out. So okay. I had about I don't know, 300 copies of the prayer of St. Francis, and I just I showed up, and when I did, there were like thousands of people there. So like, you found and, the riot. Yeah, yeah. yeah, this time I did. And um, <clears throat> I don't get me wrong, like I, I was kind of proud that Catholics are finally sticking up for themselves. Mm-hmm. Um, but, like, one guy came up to me and was like, hey, Father, I got you covered. Like, he was packing a pistol. I was like, ah, no. I mean, and and things, they were like, if you looked in the news, you saw people actually fist fighting and stuff. Mm-hmm. So I just kept backing up, backing up, backing up. And then the rosary ended and things started to sort of calm down. I looked around and I wasn't with the Catholics anymore. Mm. Uh, in fact, I had actually backed up into the Satanists because they were all dressed in black. And really? I guess I felt more comfortable there. Yeah. Um, but so you just this, threw your hood over the yeah, head, and they're like, where do you get one yeah, of those? Right, exactly. Um, but there's this kid standing to my left with dreads and, like, tattoo sleeves and stuff. And mm-hmm. I look over at him, and I'm like, you're not here to pray the rosary, are you? <laughs> and he goes, no. Are you one of those religious people? And I was like, what, are you going to stereotype me because I'm wearing a hoodie like now suddenly? <laughs> he thought that was funny, thanks be to God. <laughs> and um, so we started talking, and he was like, well, I, I said, well, why are you here? He's like, well, because I heard this, because Umar Lee said there were white supremacists here, and I want to resist them. And I was like, well, I'm not a white supremacist. And he's like, well, are there any racists in your group? And I, I was like, well, yeah, actually, probably. I I was there to listen, right? So I, I I was trying to really take him seriously, and I thought, yeah, there probably are some racists in my group. I was like, but Black Lives Matter, I know about you guys. You're you're Marxist, you're anti-family, you're anti-Christian, you're <clears throat> violent. I've seen the. And he goes, well, I'm a Christian, and mm. I don't know what Marxism is. So, <laughs> and, and so actually, he ended up pretty. We ended up having a really interesting talk. But I, at last, I was finally, I was like, well, this Umar Lee guy, he's a really violent, evil man, right? I, and he goes, well, ask him yourself. He's sitting on your right. So I was like, oh, hi. <laughs> and he says, how are you? And I said, well, I figure and I had nothing to lose. I said, Mr. Lee, I've heard you are a violent, evil man. And he goes, where'd you hear that? And I said, the internet. <laughs> I said, but but in fairness to me, um, I saw you on the news. He goes, oh, and the news is real fair to Catholics. <laughs> so, so now he had the sort of moral high ground. And, uh, we got to talking, and pretty soon, we, I, well, eventually I, I, I got uncomfortable, and I decided I was going to leave. And he said, well, look, look, we're, we're going to start our protest now. Why don't you start us off with a prayer? Mm. And, and I said, well... I, I the, God forbid that the abbot sees me leading a Black Lives Matter protest of the century, which he did because I was in the paper the next day. Because he handed me the megaphone and a bottle of water, <laughs> and he's like, "Go!" And I was like, "But I don't even agree with you." He's like, "We," he said, "I don't care. Just you can pray, right?" And I was like, "All right, you know." And I said, "Well, you know, Jesus did say if you offer someone one of my little ones a cup of cold water and." Mr. Lee just did exactly that. Like so, I started handing out the prayer of St. Francis, and the Muslims that were like really into it, they're like, "Oh yeah, we know that guy. He visited the Sultan." Mm-hmm. And we all prayed the prayer of St. Francis, and came back the next day, and the statue is still there. So I guess wow, I don't know who knows. But I'm, we, I'm, oh right, but well, I'm trying to understand. You yeah. said you backed from the Catholics into the Satanists. And then you yeah, talked about the well, fellow with the dreads, but he said he was a Christian. So yeah, so I guess, I guess everything was moving everybody and shaking. Just, yeah, moving around. Yeah. And, but by the way, we exchanged numbers, and then a couple of weeks later, he, he wrote me an email, and he said, uh, what's the Catholic Church's position on weed, smoking weed? And mm. so I tried to figure that out, and then I wrote to him, he wrote back, and pretty soon I was like, well, you know, 
we got to, somebody got to be listening to these conversations. So we start a podcast. Okay, so he's a Muslim. This is the Muslim. Yeah. What I need? What's the name of your it's podcast? It's called Disagreement. I don't know that it's very good, to be honest. I, yeah. <laughs> not. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm a great self promoter, but. So uh, you and him, what you meet weekly to do these, or what? We've published, I think, twenty something episodes, mm. and we meet every now and then. And for for our season finale last, oh oh, and we we I composed the music for it too. We, he brought Ramadan music, and I brought yeah. Gregorian chant. We spliced it together for the opening theme music, nice. and I designed the icon too. I'm really proud. It's of really that. nice. I like. Thank the, you. Okay, so but, do you actually disagree? I hope you do. Well, no, that's the problem. Like every every episode is a disappointment because he keeps saying things I agree with. Like w for our season finale last year, he went off to a mass. In fact, he went to several just to make sure he was going to the right one somehow. Mm. And he came back and he says, "Okay, so you guys believe that's Jesus up there, right?" I'm like, "Yeah." He's like, "No, no, no. Like that's actually Jesus on the altar." I'm like, "Yes." He goes, no, 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 no. I mean, like, the incarnate creator of the cosmos appears in your church. I'm like, yes. And you're in the top 30% of Catholics right now, theologically. Omar. He goes, well, how come you don't dress up for that? I'm like, man, you got me. Like, you're right. I mean, he, was, he was really kind of scandalized by the what he, uh, well, that Allah should condescend it to be there, even when we don't respect it, you know. Um, and then he, and then he went on. He was like, uh, "And who are you sacrificing to anyway?" Because it looks to me like the priest is sacrificing the people in the in the <clears throat> mosque. We all face the same direction. I was like, Umar, <laughs> you are an ad orientum traditionalist guy. He's like, "Okay, fine," because. We only we have a sacred language. And I thought you guys had one too, but everything was you know, like, oh my gosh, Umar. I don't know. Anyway, who knows what he, he's always saying these bizarre things that turn out to be make curious sense to me. So. Yeah, he's trying to understand Catholicism from the heart of Catholicism. He's try, He's saying yeah, like, he, okay, well, if what you say is true, then this ought to yeah, follow. It yeah. doesn't seem to follow, and you're like, yeah, you're right. You got us on that one. Yeah. Mm. Well, and and really, I it. I, I've only I'm I'm ashamed to say I've only listened to one episode of this Pints with Aquinas, but the one I listened to was like changed my life. Good. It, was, it was the one with a guy named Gomer. Yeah. Okay, where you talked about liturgy and all this stuff, and and yeah, I mean he's like, it's become just sort of a little party we throw it in some sort of like cafeteria or something. It's. In fact, I even sat down and I wrote what I call my Fratifesto Good. for vocations directors everywhere, which <laughs> I will probably never publish. But uh, but I, I think we need to restore a lot of that sense of awe and wonder to our liturgy. And unless we do, we're never going to get any more priests. Are you the vocations director? Yeah. Yeah. So, What do you think the tactic of vocation directors has been and what should it be? <laughs> oh no, <laughs> I'm gonna get in so much trouble. Because um, I know I was, fancy pamphlets did nothing for me. Yeah, I wanted to see men who really lived as if this was true and who wore the habit and didn't say things like "Call me Greg." Right, right. Well, I I was on a panel a couple of actually this is a couple of years ago, and um, it, they had a single person, a married person, a deacon, and a priest, and a Jesuit, and a Dominican. And one by one, they each talked, and they were like, well, consider your call. You know, maybe you're called to be a Benedict, and maybe you're called to be a... And by the time they got to me, I was asleep. <laughs> really asleep? Yeah. Okay. I, and they and they woke me up, and they're like, well, why should anyone be a Benedict? And I was like, you know what? You shouldn't. You probably won't make it through the training. Mm -hmm. Even then, we lose men in the field. We had a guy run off just the other day, just couldn't take it. Like... And, That's uh, right, and yeah, I was like, yeah. but you know what JP2 said? He said, this calling is objectively superior to any other calling. So, you know, do what you want with that. I don't understand it. But, and I sat down, they gave me a standing ovation. But I think, you know, you never hear the Marines saying, you know, please, you know, please, please, it doesn't matter. Just join us. Yeah. Or, but you also never hear them saying, <clears throat> consider the Army. That's a nice branch. You know, the Navy's pretty good. 
Air Force or maybe a Marine, you know. I, so I tell kids when I do my vocation talks, I'm like, look, you want someone to talk you into marriage, talk to your parents, but I think everyone in the world should be a monk. Although you probably won't be able to. Yeah, right. And you won't get I through mean, the training. Yeah. yeah. I, actually, I was talking to somebody the other day, and I decided, though, and we decided that being a priest is harder at the outset, but probably a little easier later on. Okay. But marriage is easy at the outset mm -hmm. and harder later on. Yeah, I can see I that. I don't know if that's true or not, but... Yeah, it, it's hard if you don't keep dying. Ooh. That's what it is. So in the beginning, it's funny, I was talking to a friend about this today. Like, I don't think you can realize that this beautiful Eve in front of you is not wretched like you're wretched. She appears right. to be salvation for you. Right. And so you can know all the right knowledge in your head that she's not God and I shouldn't hang my coat on a hook that wasn't meant to bear the way as Christopher West so well put it so puts it so well. Well, like well, don't, no, well, don't expect your wife to make you happy. You yeah, will crush you her. You complete me. Yeah, that kind of stuff. <laughs> and so you know that all yeah. intellectually, but you don't know that. Like she appears like she appears to be Eden. And yeah. I'm something similar for the woman to the man. Yeah. And then what happens is you encounter each other and your sinfulness, your woundedness, your defense yeah. mechanisms. But for me, what I've realized is if, I'll, if I just die, well, someone said the problem with a living sacrifice is it keeps trying to climb off the altar. But if, <laughs> if I just stay there, then, yeah. then the friendship deepens. And it's way, it is, I know this sounds like a cliche, but like my friendship with my wife is so much greater now than it was when we first met. That's right. true. And it's better. Yeah. And I'm, I love it, but it is. It, I, I see the point, though. I think that. Yeah, I was thinking mainly of kids. <laughs> yeah. I don't believe I that you. I don't kids. believe you find kids boring. No, I don't. Yeah, if you I met my like sons, my daughters, they're so good. I think. I think adults find children boring because they're boring. Hey. You know? No, but that's why I said I don't yeah, think yeah. it's true. Because yeah, we live in different right, stories. Right. My story like is get your shoes on and it. get into the car. Yeah. My, my son's story is I'm a bird and. Or maybe yeah. I'm pretending to be a caterpillar. That's such a better story. Yeah. Of I course, just, if adults acted like that, we'd be screwed. So I'm not suggesting that. But children really remind us to be human a lot of the time, I think. Yeah, they do. Which is why a lot of monasteries run schools. Hmm. Because I think the kids keep us young, keep us in our place. Hmm. I, was, I was walking through the junior school, our junior school, the other day. And I had a copy of uh, British Literature for Dummies. And this little seventh grade walk goes to me and goes, what are you reading that for? And I go, so I can figure out how to teach you? <laughs> he goes, I'm not British. <laughs> I'm like, Come here, you little... Brrr. But yeah, but uh, yeah, they keep you humble. They keep you... Yeah. But what about... I mean, have you gone through periods of your vocation where you're like, oh, I'm done. Like, maybe this isn't going to work out. Or have you had a result... Uh, this morning? Yeah. Yeah. No, uh, yeah, about every other week. Uh, there's a great Desert Father story where this monk, um, oh, well, I, I, should, I should look it up, but it's something like this monk decided to leave his monastery, so he packed up his stuff, and he said, I will leave tomorrow. The next day he did the same thing, and for eight years he kept doing this until finally God lifted the temptation. Yeah. And that's basically me. <laughs> like about every other week I think I can't do this anymore. Yeah, but somehow I'm still there. Can I can I press into that? And yeah. you, you abandon if it starts getting too personal. But like what is it about it that because I mean I, I, I don't think that in my vocation. I mean there are times really? where I feel like I'm being pressed to the limit. And there are times where I've been such a jerk that I'm I realized this beautiful thing, this friendship that I call marriage is not unbreakable. Like I could screw this up like men before me have screwed their marriages up. And there's yeah. nothing special about me and this woman that makes it otherwise. But I I no, I don't I don't ever want to abandon it. Although I suppose there's a maybe there's a difference because the relationship is so much more obvious and personal. Yeah, I wonder. And the um, fallout of my children and my wife had right, destroyed. Right. No, I couldn't do that to kids. Um yeah, I um, I don't know. Well, now you're making me wonder whether I was ever really going to leave. Because <laughs> uh, I don't know, I think actually, maybe that I could I, do that I, to my 
Bro, are you being? I mean, like maybe it's just that hyperbole, right? Because I think a lot of people are afraid to acknowledge that. Yeah, sometimes. No, I think, no, it's not just hyperbole. Like okay. I've had some real crises. Um, but usually, what happens is, uh, well, I, I know during the novitiate, I, I would go back to my novice master. It became sort of a ritual. I would say, "All right, Father Patrick, I'm leaving," and he'd say, "Today." <laughs> I'd say, "Well." Okay, not today. Well, good. Be a good monk today. Leave tomorrow. And by the time the next day came, I would have changed my mind again. Um, but what, what was your question again? Yeah, it was I guess really just, serious. Well, dealing with the... Have you ever decided, this? I'm done with this? this is... I don't think I've ever decided that I was done. But I've definitely wished I was somewhere else. Yeah. Isn't that true of all of us? Well, yeah, I guess so. I mean, that's the human lot in life. the 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 single man wishes he were married, and the married man wishes he were yeah. a priest, and the priest wishes he were a monk, and the monk wishes he were a hermit, and the hermit wishes he was married. Yeah, we call it looking over the wall. See, that novice has been looking over the wall. Wonder what they're doing over there. You know, wonder how I'd look as a, in a white habit. You know, right. I remember a bishop in a homily saying, like, ask any newly ordained priest, you know, maybe five months in, eight months yeah. in, like, is being called father and wearing shiny vestments enough? Of course not. No. Ask any helps, married though. man, you know, the, the joys that come with marriage. Is it enough? It's like, yeah, it helps, but it's not, it's not what sustains you. No, no, but it is what draws you in. Yeah, and like, that's good to be honest about. Yeah, that's one thing I have tr a little trouble trying to make explain to my brother monks because they're like well if they don't like us the way we are then you know they should just leave you know mm -hmm. and i'm like well but you know you don't show up to a date with <laughs> snot on your tie you know disheveled yeah. and say hey take me like i am or yeah. else go you know you gotta you dress shouldn't. up yeah. you know yeah you won't find a good woman that way right and you won't find good vocations either unless you spruce spruce sprout spruce, spruce things up, up yeah. a little yeah. bit yeah yeah because it if you're never gonna have a, if you don't have a honeymoon period in the beginning, when will right. you have it? Like it's appropriate for a young man to have that excitement and that energy and enthusiasm in the beginning that then matures or should mature. But well, and it also occurs to me suddenly, right this second, that like the older guys in the monastery think that what's going to draw in vocations is what drew them in. But, yeah, but if I went to a date dressed the way my father dressed when he was dating, yeah. I would get yeah. I would get through the front door, you know, because styles change. I don't know. I'm not sure I believe that, but I mean, young, I young men and women want an adventure, and they want to give themselves fully to Christ. And so, if I show yeah. up at a place where I don't sense that, I don't even sense yeah. that you're challenging me to do that. You hear these yeah. stories back in the day where. People who were seeking to be um, novices were just left out in the rain for days yeah, yeah. before you know, they were Three tested. Three days, you they'd stay out there, knock, and the, the I I do this with ki little kids. I say, well, let's say Jeffrey decides he wants to be a monk, leave the room, and right, I knock on the door, and I, he'll say, I say, what do you want? To be a monk? And I slam the door in his face. Mm -hmm. See, that happens three times. If you're still there the third time, then you can come in. Yeah. I was at um, Mother Natalia, uh, who's a Byzantine nun. Um, um, she, I went to her final profession, her life profession. And so she'll give these golden scissors to the bishop and he throws them down the aisle. Well, he doesn't throw them. That would be dangerous. He, you know, underarm throws them down the aisle. And she has to, because when they enter the monastery, they don't cut their ha hair till their foot. So her hair was really? passed you know, down to her legs. And But three times she brings back the scissors. He throws them. On the third oh, time, to show the that. Hair. Yeah. Yeah, well, what we do is we have a, a pile of lay clothes, and then we have the habit. And mm. the habit says, choose. And is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, we had a couple of novices not long ago, and one of them went and put his hand on the... The other one went and put his hand on the lay clothes. <laughs> and went, oh, no, no, I meant the... <laughs> we also had a novice who vowed to accept corruption willingly. What does it supposed that mean? to be accept correction oh. willingly. But, yeah. <laughs> Um, Whatever you, worked for you. I love, I mean, the habit is, I, I've, I've shared this story yeah. before, but I once had a Capuchin bishop say to me, don't be afraid if the reason you're attracted to the Capuchins is the habit, which yeah. was so liberating to hear. Yeah. He said, when you're attracted to a woman, it's usually for superficial reasons. Right, right. You can't right. stay there, but if yeah. you shouldn't pretend that's not what's drawing you. And I, 
thought that was helpful. I was I was working as a waiter in a restaurant on top of a skyscraper in St. Louis. Hmm. And it was a horrible, horrible, horrible job. The waiters were, it was, it was, I, I, I waited tables at two places. One was a, a fine dining place where the waiters were all real cutthroat. And I remember looking out the window and I don't know where he came from, or but it was a Franciscan in full habit walking down the street. And I thought to myself, I wish I were him right now. Hmm. It's the only time in my life I've wished I were someone else. Hmm. Like I've wished I were other places, wished I had different jobs. Right, but not a different. Like that. But I've never said to myself, except that one time I thought I'd rather be him than me right now. I have an next door neighbor who gave me some great advice. She said, never compare your inside to another's uh, outs outside. Oh, right. Which because, is so easy yeah. with the internet, isn't it? Yeah. Like Facebook, all. Or but I'm sure even as a as a you know you're an author, you you speak. I'm sh and then you, <laughs> and then I you, do speak. But then you got to speak with these bloody freakish, brilliant people. Not that you're not yeah. brilliant, but with like Father Gregory Pine, you're like, yeah. oh well, gosh. But, but and then you see the external. But see, that's the thing. You, like I say to myself, oh man, should I have been an East Coast Dominican? Those guys are so cool. Yeah. You know, then I go back home and you know, Brother Ed hasn't brushed his teeth, and he's sitting in choir going, and I go Arr. He's dead, by the way, so I can make fun of him. Okay. Uh, <laughs> does, that, does that make it better? I or think it's better. Because uh, yeah, he'll forgive cool you much now. easier than the rest of your brothers listening he to this. He vowed to haunt me after he died. He said that. Yeah. And he does. He does. I wake up every now and then. He's standing over my bed going, boogity, 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 boogity. <laughs> That's exactly what he does. Those are the words. And yep. he just breathes on you with those yeah. unbrushed teeth. Yeah. That could be the Parkinson's drugs, or maybe it's brother. Right? Tell, tell us about how you got <laughs> Parkinson's and what that's like, how it's developed, and how difficult that presumably has been. You know, I. <laughs> when did you find out? When were you diagnosed? Uh, about five years ago, I was dumped on my head in a rugby game, and the next day I started trembling. I thought, well, that's odd. Yeah. Um, and so I went to. He told me it was an essential tremor. A couple months later, it was getting worse. I went to another doctor. And another doctor and did you? I mean, you must have assumed it was Parkinson's. No, no, I, I, I mean, I've always been pretty excited about being in shape and fit and yeah. cool and whatever, and I just didn't want that to be the case because I didn't want to be weak and whatever. Yeah. But um, yeah, so it, it, it's not that the concussions caused it, but they probably okay. did speed it up a lot. Okay. Which is part of the reason why I'm I have a tendency when I speak quickly to slur my words. Okay, I have not I'm not drunk yet. You didn't do that before. Oh, no, no. Um, in fact, but interestingly, um, about seven years ago, I had an operation where they installed. This is actually an electrical wire in my neck, and oh it goes all the way up into my brain. And there's a pacemaker here that I recharge with like a phone charger. And um, one of our alumni pioneered this surgery called deep brain stimulation. So if you had seen me, oh, I don't know, 10 years or uh, six years ago, I'd have been like this. I was like, really? Yeah. But, and there's the, the well, operation you, you was so like successful. Yeah. Well, I, I was, I was, oh, I was you like, were? Uh, okay. there's the, uh, they, they, you have to be awake while they do the surgery. It's really freaky. Oh you my goodness. Feel them drilling it in. Bzzz, oh, the, yeah. It takes hours. But uh, they, they actually filmed the surgery. It's online. And the moment they, and they say, okay, we're going we're gonna to turn it on in three, two, one. And I go, huh. Because wow. I'm pretty high. Cause you, can't do, cause you can't get your brain worked on without that. Yeah. But, um, and wow. then they ask you to bless them. Yeah. We, and then. Well, that would, must have just changed your life. Oh, it did. It did. In more ways than one, because the, the head surgeon, a guy named Chris Calhorn, whose father, by the way, his mother died two years ago, and his father just joined our monastery. Hmm. Anyway, he was the lead surgeon, and he got, he's got like 20 assistants. One guy turning the lights off and on, another guy like wiping the sweat off his head and adjusting this and that. Nurse anesthetist and this person, that person. Hmm. He gathers them all and he says, Okay, we're going to sing a hymn. Which one's it going to be? And they say, Amazing Grace. And they all sang Amazing Grace. And hmm. I'm crying and he's crying. And I'm like, Well, thank you guys. He goes, Well, wait a second. We didn't do that for you. 
He said, like, just because it's science doesn't I mean it isn't a miracle. Mm. So we do this after every surgery. Mm. And so, so God bless Georgetown. You know, I think they probably got some problems in other areas. But Did it feel like a kick in the guts when you were told you have Parkinson's disease? <laughs> um, yeah, I guess so. I, I, I don't. The thing is, I could get hit by a car leaving here, so I'm just not going to worry about it. I, some people say I'm in denial, but I'm pretty happy here, so I think I'm going to stay. And besides that, like, when, when I first got it, they didn't have deep brain stimulation. Mm. Who knows what they're going to have five years from now? They might yeah. find a cure or whatever. I mean, it's just not worth worrying about. And besides that, I could have Crohn's. I could. I, I have yeah. a friend with Crohn's who's had, mm. like, six operations and yeah. I mean or and I met a priest uh I gave a retreat to a bunch of retired priests and one of them has ALS he was diagnosed six months ago he's already lost all speech Bless. as a talk with one of these speaking yeah. computers yeah great man I always beaming really? and he's got like three more months to live how I mean how do so we... this is like great compared to that you know I guess so that's probably one way we can endure our sufferings without becoming bitter but what advice would you have for those who are really struggling right now who look at you and they're like, if this is not an act and he really is just this lighthearted and joyful off podcast, then I want to know what he thinks. And huh. Yeah, I am. I'm a happy monk. Um, but why? I mean, this is what I have. This is me. I mean, like, I, sometimes I think to myself, like, what if all human? Well, there are a couple ways I think about. It. One was, uh, my sister had uh, uh, her child had a horrible disease, and she said, "I remember her telling me that she was praying, God, give it to me. Mm. Don't give it to my kid." And and I have an, and I have these three nieces who, as much as I like to make fun of them, mm -hmm. I love them. But I kind of wonder if maybe somehow in the divine algebra. I pray God give that give Parkinson's to me, not mm. to Rachel. And <laughs> I'm sorry to get choked up. And maybe he answered that prayer. Mm -hmm. um, why am I getting choked up? Um, but but I'm happy to have it. I, I really am. Yeah. Huh. Well, it's I've never real, I've never cried over this. Hmm. It's probably helpful for people to hear from someone who suffers, hearing from people who don't suffer nearly as much as they do. It must be. It's kind of like when someone writes a how to parent your children book and they don't have children yet. You're yeah. like, shut up. Yeah. Well, I, I also really believe in my heart that huh, I have never cried over this. Mm. Sorry. No, come Holy Spirit. Um, yeah. The gift of tears. Um. I mean, I really believe that suffering is the most powerful prayer we have. So, oh, well, okay. I, I was, golly, I've never done this before. Um, I mean, I've cried before, but usually for effect. Um, this is not the case here. Um, I, w I, I was giving a retreat to the EWTN Poor Clares. They mm -hmm. call themselves the Rich Clares. Um <laughs> But they're a wonderful group, and boy, have they suffered. I mean, they went when mother died, they went from 44 nuns to 16, oh, wow. like in like five years. Mm. Now they're back up and running. They got four novices and a postulant. They're great, but they, they had to suffer first. Um, but they've got this old nun, Sister Regina Laudis, or something like that. Anyway, she died like about a month ago, but she was still alive when I went to give the retreat. I said, could you go talk to her? And so I did, and she said to me, I have a four-inch hole in my side. Mm -hmm. It's been there for a month and a half. She's like, it won't heal. She says, I'm just like Jesus. Mm -hmm. like, I was like, oh, my God, that's awesome. I'm like, are you ready to die? She's like, not yet, not yet. And I'm like, why, why do you want to live with that? She's like, so I can suffer? Oh. Yeah, I know. Like, it, 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 when she <laughs> found out she was dying... She went to every nun and apologized. Yeah, yeah. So I went back to the nuns and I was like, that woman is a saint. And they all started laughing. 
And I was like, why are you laughing? She, they go, she was a terrible nun. <laughs> so I went back. I was like, your sister said you're a terrible nun. She's like, oh, yeah. She's like, all I do is sit in my room and watch television. Yeah. She's like, but she's like, God's making me a saint by default. She's like, I just can't do any of the sinful things I used to do. So in a way, like, I try to think of it like that, too. Like, it definitely slows down my speaking. Mm -hmm. uh, it's reduced the amount of, like, running and playing I can do. But I have a little extra suffering to offer for Christ. That's beautiful. My wife's like you. She, I mean, she doesn't suffer in the same way, but she is so good. I mean, I get to see her at her worst, and her worst is so much better than me. And yeah. my, you know, and she's always offering suffering for Christ. My kids make fun of her playfully because yeah. she'll walk around the house sometimes, go praise you Jesus, praise you Jesus, Ugh. so they kind of like mock her. So. But but she's really wow. that she's come to an understanding that I don't know yet. I think she'll say yeah. things like, "Every saint suffered, like we have to suffer," yeah. which is just the exact opposite of the advice the world. Right. Like the world says, you don't have to suffer. You can be well, happy all the time, which, of course, you can't be. Yeah. Well, you know, well, I mean, you know about the saint who, let's see, I can't remember his name, but he was born, he was born to this wealthy family and with brothers and sisters who loved him, who brought him up well, and he had this great education, and he got married and was happy. He had all these kids, and I think he died pretty old, and, and he had an easy death, right? Mm -hmm. You know? The, you know, no, Sorry. of course you don't. Sorry. There's no such saint. There's no thing. There's no no. There's oh, no saint like this was that, a right? Joke. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Sorry. But there's <laughs> you no said saint. It with such sincerity. Yeah, yeah. We've just been done talking about the most bizarre <laughs> saints I've ever heard of. I just assumed. The, yeah. There's right. no saint who just had a happy life and died well, right? I mean, that's that doesn't make saints out of people. Although I did, I, I have told the abbot that I want to be the first saint who hasn't had to suffer. But so I'd, like, far. I'll, I'd like to be the saint of. Of not suffering, patron saint of, and then what of you, just happiness. And then there's the suffering of being misunderstood. And how does that bother you? Um, oh, how, how, the suffering of being misunderstood. I mean, you, doesn't you that said bother that everyone. It bothers, I, I, it bothers yeah. everybody. But you talked about the speech. You've started oh. to slow your speech in a way that maybe you didn't yeah, before. Has that been? Um, you accidentally make jokes about Muhammad sometimes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I always give this little disclaimer before I give talks. I'm like, I'm not angry, and you're not in trouble, and don't wave back. It's just me. Um, now nah, I'm not could quite you move there in for me, please. Thanks. What's that? Could you just move in for me? Oh, oh yeah. sorry. Uh, yeah, I'm not quite there yet. Um, but I guess when it happens, I'll just have to become a better contemplative. You know, one thing I try. Honestly, with I shouldn't be traveling around this much anyhow. One thing I try to remind myself is just that if it wasn't this, it would be something else. Like if I wasn't complaining about this thing that yeah. feels unbearable, I'd be complaining about something else. And that would be the. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And there's always something to complain about. Yeah. We had, we had, I, I'm, I'm working on a new translation of the desert fathers hmm. or, or maybe more like a new tell a retelling because what's there are all these written in. What's the uh, language? Aramaic, Greek. I don't actually speak any of these languages, but I'm trying to retell. I mean, the thing oh, is, it's, it's all oral tradition. Yeah, so yeah. many of these stories I just heard from old monks. That's you right. Know? I've read through that. Uh, one of the, is it the Desert Fathers or is a simple book? Right? Yeah. The, well, the uh, Benedict Award uh, wrote most of the Greek translations of that. But there are hundreds and hundreds of sayings. Some of which I'd never heard before, which are great. Like, like this one. Um, there's a, a monk went into a, no, no, no. A philosopher from Athens went into the deserts seeking wisdom, and found a monk who did nothing but insult him every day. At the end of the day, the monk would demand payment <laughs> and then leave. He did this for three years. What a job! Yeah. He did this for three years, and finally the, the philosopher said, that's it, I'm going back to Athens, this is ridiculous. <laughs> so he, he's walking back into Athens, and there's a bum lying down by the gates, insulting people as they walk by. So he insults this young philosopher, the philosopher looks at him and laughs. He goes, why do you laugh when I insult you? He says, because I've been paying for that for three <laughs> years, you just gave it to me for free. And the, and the bum stands up and bows and says... The city is yours, right? Like, I'd never even heard that one before. But I'm also collecting 
the what I'm going to call the the sayings of the urban fathers, okay. so, like just people that I know. <laughs> but one of them is, uh, I think he's the the superior of the fathers of mercy, or he was. I was talking to one of them, and he said, "Oh, this is a good one." He used to say at the end of every um, conference, he would say, "Brothers, life just goes on and on." And on, and on. <laughs> oh, and and uh, the sister servants of the eternal word, mother, uh, their mother superior said to them. Uh, one of the one of the novices went up to her and asked her something. She said, "Sister, you will find in this life that the answer to many of your questions is simply." Hmm. <laughs> like, Good luck writing that. Yeah, p p p b h t h t h p p p b is just. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Has your Parkinson's made it more difficult to write or no, that hasn't affected that at all by the look of it? Yeah. Well, the typing was hard for a while. Um, yeah. Yeah. I typed a lot slower than I used to. I, I actually wrote, I wrote out a pretty good joke. I said, how many guys with Parkinson's does it take to change a light bulb? I texted to my friend, said, how many? I said, <laughs> or, or no, one. <laughs> Whatever. It doesn't matter. <laughs> Who cares? Yeah. It, takes a, it takes two because the other guy's got to not have Parkinson's. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. It's even better. Hey, I'll write this down. Again. Did you just come up with that? Because that was really good. Yeah, I did. That's really I did. good. You I definitely write this, that down. By the way, I was the second funniest guy in Houston, Texas for two years. How do you know that? Because I entered a stand up comedy did competition. You? The other guy was legitimately funnier. But yeah. if I killed him, you would I would have, well, but then I would have simultaneously not been very funny at the same time. Yeah, so it's like, hard to be like, he was really funny, yeah. then he killed that guy. <laughs> then he killed him. And everyone yeah. laughs because they thought that was a joke. Like, yeah. no, he actually bludgeoned yeah, him to then, death on stage. Then, not, then he's there were children the, the there. least yeah. there funniest were guy in run. Houston, Texas. Wow. So do you stand up before, well, a little, before yeah. you were a monk? I was also a professional juggler. Hmm. Yeah. Which is, uh, after one of the competitions, I used to do a little juggling and some stand-up and sort of mix it up. And uh, after the competition, one of the judges was like, yeah, I just hate jugglers. So oh. like, okay, that's cool. How much like of myself, to be honest. Mostly to failed hippies. There's a Apologies to any jugglers. There's okay. a school called St. Gregory the Great Academy in Scranton, yeah. Pennsylvania. and they, they, they have a rugby they have, team. They, yeah, and their boys juggle. And they're incredibly Juggling gifted. and rugby. Yeah, I know. You see, it's moments like that I say, ooh, maybe I should have been a, what are they, what are the society of uh, well, no, they're Christ not, they're the not, king or something? They're not a religious order. Oh, no? No, it's a, it's a high school. It's a boarding school. But it was run by somebody. Uh, I th well, there was different. I think the FSSP had it at one point. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Um, Humility Rules. I've seen this book, and I, I didn't even know until about two weeks ago after we had asked you to come on the show that you wrote this, St. Benedict's 12-Step <laughs> Guide to Genuine Self-Esteem. I get kind of tired of the self-esteem movement. Mm. I remember watching a comedy. He's talking to these people who were there for encouragement. He's like, the problem with self-help books is it's yourself that sucks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, that's uh, we had this wonderful shrink or rather therapist or counselor at the school who used to start all of his talks off with things like, don't let the village raise your child or don't, uh, uh, don't follow your dreams. And so I kind of plagiarized the titles from him. So they, they have titles like, yeah, don't follow your dreams. Think out, think inside the box. Yeah. I mean, there's a reason why the box is there, frankly, you know, <laughs> yeah, things like good. that. Um, so, okay, I'm going to ask you to tell me something about humility. Okay. Tell me something about humility. Ah. Uh, that was me asking you. It's not what you think. What do you think? What do we think it is? I, no, uh, I don't know, but whatever it is you're thinking, it's not, <laughs> it's that. not that. You got to read the book first. <laughs> um, well, I think humility, I think a lot of people tend to think that humility is more sort of self-deprecation just sort of like oh my gosh i'm just not worthy you know sort of thing i had a friend at oxford actually he's not a jesuit god help him a great jesuit there's a whole new generation of jesuits coming up through I'm the ranks i'm gonna believe man. it when i see that oh yeah yeah they're they're taking over st louis university and they're they're amazing really yeah Thank in god. particular a father potter noster that's his name. great name i know <laughs> 
Um, he's the only one whose name I can remember for exactly that reason. Uh, but uh, anyway, the he, he uh, his fa- his family lived in a castle, right? Mm-hmm. I didn't know this at the time, um, but they invited me up to Christmas dinner. This and, is in England or where? Yeah, in England. Yeah, yeah sorry. Yeah, the, the, yeah. Not in like St. Louis. No, there, are, yeah. there aren't many castles in St. Louis. The Bush family <laughs> might have one, but... Um, the Anyway, so we're coming around this turn, and there's their house, and it's like four stories with its own golf course and Eucharistic Adoration Chapel and tennis courts, and, and I'm like... I mean, I'm entirely detached from material possessions, but I went, whoa! <laughs> <laughs> I looked over at his mom, and she goes, yeah, isn't it great? <laughs> like, and I thought, it just, I just thought, it, that stunned me more than the castle did, because you would have thought she'd say something like, you know, oh, well, it's really hard to keep up, you know, yeah, or it's yeah. very, you know, uh, but, but instead she saw it as a gift, and she appreciated it, and... It was, years later, I read something from John Chrysostom where he says something like, if you denigrate the gifts that God gives you, that gives him no glory. Yeah. All right? Um, because I, I think people tend to think of humility as saying something like, oh, well, it's really hard to keep up. You know, it's really, I, I'm, I'm not that good of a preacher. or I'm not, you know. I, I heard a story once. I One of our monks, his mother was a... Uh, Stewardess for Pan Am back in the day, back in the 60s, and she met Fulton Sheen. Hmm. And as he was getting on the plane, he suddenly looked at her and said, You are very beautiful. Now use that beauty to serve God, hmm. bring people to Jesus through that. And I mean, I, if you're beautiful, I mean, I'm beautiful, and I can't, uh, and I can admit it. Like, you know, <laughs> I can't do that. I can't say that with a straight face. But I mean, the point is that, like, yeah, God gives us all these great gifts, and to to say you don't really have them does him no. Ju- you were talking about you're great at self promotion or something like that earlier, but yeah, why shouldn't you be? <clears throat> I don't you remember guys, saying you, that. But... Or you, or you said something about like I don't have anything against self promotion. Oh or, no. Yeah, is that no? Well, I don't think I have anything wrong with self promotion. No, but if you've got a great product, yeah, promote it. Like yeah, if th- yeah. th- this is really cool what you're doing here. Yeah. But and by the way, I think it's a great uh, this whole idea of doing having like a three hour podcast uh-huh. is just a fantastic internet antidote to the the meme culture, the thirty second TikTok mm. distractions. Uh, I think this is a great idea. Mm. Uh, not sure I'm going to be able to make it three hours, but we'll see. We'll see. We'll have a break. <laughs> how long have we had? How long have we been going? I don't know. How long have we been going for? One twenty-seven. One twenty-seven. Self wow. a- self abasement. I like this. So is this a quote from Benedict? No one should be excused from kitchen duty because <laughs> this is how merit and charity are required. Also, the server should wash the linens at the end of the week and do the <laughs> Saturday cleaning. Both the <laughs> outgoing and the incoming servers should wash the feet of all. Chapter thirty. That's from chapter thirty-five on kitchen duty. What page? <laughs> well, we're at one hundred and seven. One hundred and seven. I can't remember. But, what but I the think. idea is self-abasement. I, I want you to talk about that. What is self-abasement? You, yeah. Well, um, do you want me to pass mine to you if you can't find it? No, I found it. I was just thinking about. Um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> One of our monks used to joke that he was going to write a book called Digging Yourself a Basement. Um, I, I missed that. Is that funny? A, yeah, because digging yourself a basement. See, so you get it? It's a pun. Digging it's, yourself a basement. I, I don't yeah, get it. Well, you ever heard like dig it? You dig it? Oh, okay. I'm digging sure. myself a basement. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, never I don't mind. get that at all. Uh, yeah. In little, Australia, we can say... Can we please uh, just eliminate <laughs> the last 30 seconds of that? <laughs> In Australia, they say... Oh, no, because it was mom, genius and Matt didn't get it. <laughs> my mum used to say... <laughs> my mum used to say you got tickets on yourself. You ever heard that? Or they'll say, don't go outside, the tickets will blow off. No, what does that even mean? I don't know. I don't understand. I guess like you're buying tickets to see yourself. I never understood it, but mum used to say, yeah, bloody, he's got bloody tickets. It's funny oh. how these sayings shorten. So you, maybe in the beginning it was like, you think you're so good, you'd buy tickets to see yourself. And then oh. 20 years later, someone said, you've got tickets on yourself. 
Oh. You're buying it for yourself. And now they just say you go outside, the tickets will blow off, and no one knows what that means. But there you are. Yep. You ever heard the You're expression, right. are looking you looking wearing it. that shirt on your head? No. No, neither have I. just made it That's up. That's a good thing. Let's see if we can get it going. We can get it going, yeah, but, and then like, oh, yeah. We, we decided in our high school that we were going to turn spit into a cool word. Like, man, that's so spit. Did it work? No. No. But Self abasement. Be, sorry. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what was that? Um, yeah. The, uh, it, it's not self-loathing. And it's not self-disparaging. It's just an accurate sense of yourself. Like, I, I always wondered about folks like, Teresa of Avila who say, like, I'm just a worm, you know, and you say, no, you're not, you're Teresa of Avila, like, you're amazing. Um, but I think the, I've heard that the holier you get, the less holy you feel. And, and the reason would be because you're closer to God, right? And I try to, I tell the kids that it's like standing next to a skyscraper when you're far away. You feel mm -hmm. as big as you as the skyscraper, but as you get closer and closer and closer, pretty soon you're standing next to it. You look up and you feel really, really tiny. Yeah. And I think I think that's what self abasement is. Yeah. Is it's it's sort of the I there is healthy self esteem, right? Obviously, um, the sense of being in the image of God, but there's that other part of self awareness. That recognizes our fallenness and our flaws, um, and that's what self-abasement is: is is coming to terms with your fallenness and the the things that you're not good at. I and mean, that's that's why I just I just hate it when people say like you can do anything as long as you put your mind to it. Mm. You know, I go I I I go to a lot of high school graduations now. And every one of them ends with some valedictorian right? saying, you know, we're going to always be friends. And with a blah, blah education, you'll be able to do anything. Yeah. You know, you go out there and follow your dreams. You know, God forbid there's a Jeffrey Dahmer in the audience, right? I mean, the, the, you, know, you, you shouldn't, if you got stupid dreams or unrealistic dreams or, oh, speaking of podcasts, you, you ever heard of uh, Christopher Dench? Mm -mm. Oh, you got to listen to this podcast, a five-part series on, uh, I don't know, it was in the Atlantic Monthly, they made it into a podcast. Anyway, the point is, he's he's this uh, not real bright, not real athletic kid from like, I don't know, Tennessee, Kentucky, something like that, decides he wants to play Division One football, right? So he goes out for the team, doesn't make it, but they... Um, he shows up to practice anyway, gets extra time with the coaches, gets his friends to help him. So he ends up, I think, lineman for Alabama. Bang, good for him. But didn't, didn't graduate with much of an education, obviously. So he says, I'm going to be a neurosurgeon. Goes back, gets his PhD in neurology, MD. He becomes one of the only PhD, MD neurosurgeons in the country. Right. Sets up practice in Dallas, Texas, where he kills, maims, or or gravely injures 35 people. Why? Because he was a terrible surgeon, right? And and he wouldn't listen to people when they said, "No, you're no good at this." And How he'd come say, he "Passed his exams?" Or he would just say, "Come on, coach, just put me, give me one more shot." And he was so compelling, right? He wasn't gonna let anyone get in the way of his dreams. He He's really in should prison have. now, really. Right? Yeah, because they just couldn't stop him. Yeah. Right? So so follow your dreams is great advice unless it's neurosurgery, right? <laughs> I, mean, I I don't care how much I want to be a neurosurgeon. If I if you're on the operating table and you see me coming towards you, yeah. run for the hills because I'm gonna scramble your brains. In fact, I had oh, I have a student who is now an open heart surgeon and he studied with this guy. It this is in my decision book. <laughs> But he, st I could get the details wrong, but he stayed with this guy who uh, eventually, after one of the surgeries, he took him aside and he said, show me your hands. And he looked at him and he said, you know, what I really wanted to be was an Olympic swimmer. He says, I went to a special prep school run by Russians <laughs> that uh, for, for swimmers. And one day after practice, Mr. Ravinsky called me over and he said, just what I'm saying to you now, he said, show me your hands. And I did, and he said, 
you will never be an Olympic swimmer. Not with hands like that. And he said, that was the day that Mr. Ravinsky crushed my dreams. He's like, and thank God for Mr. Ravinsky, because these little hands, terrible at swimming. Yeah. Fantastic at open heart surgery. Wow. I get it. Yeah. yeah I, the, which is where obedience comes into all this, right? Like that, that you have to be willing to admit there are people older and wiser and smarter than you in the world who know more about these things. And I, I think Americans are just not, I'm not real good at just doing what we're told, right? Mm -hmm. I, if, if Christopher Dench, I, surely, no, no, I, I know because I'm obsessed with this guy. Uh, there were people all the way along the road that said, you know, you're just not very good at this. Why don't you become a research scientist? Why don't you do this? Uh, but he, he wasn't going to let anyone get in the way of his dreams. Mm -hmm. He was going to, he, he could do anything yeah. as long as he put his mind to it. This is a true story. It sounds like I'm making it up after what we've just said. But when I was a child, I remember people saying you can do anything you put your mind to. And as about right. a five-year-old, totally I was bold. jumping off the couch trying to fly. <laughs> now, thankfully, I never made it up to the roof. Yeah. But um, yeah, it turns out it, I couldn't it, fly, actually. Really? I Yeah. I, I would flap my hands. I but once slept you, you come in St. Joseph of Can you come forward to the bedroom? mic? Oh, yeah, shoot. Gotta, sorry. That's right. Yeah. You, you once uh, slept in whose bed? St. Joseph of Cupertino's bedroom. How did you do that? He, he'd been dead for hundreds of no, years. No, I knew so that. I, but how did you, how that's did you get in? That's my confirmation say. Really? He's the patron saint of stupid people and airplane pilots because he could levitate, right? Yeah. And he was so dumb that the bishop finally said, look, if you can answer one question on this test, I will ordain you. And he answered one question correctly. So, uh, But he was so holy Whenever you would think of Jesus, he would levitate. Yeah, and the kid and the kids used to follow him around in the streets and go, "Jesus, hey!" <laughs> okay, uh, and so his brothers would tie him to the to his chair and choir because they were embarrassed. Um, but anyway, I, I I figured after spending the night in his. But how did you get cell, access to that? Did yeah, you? this was when this was back when I was an archaeologist and working in that monastery, and the monk took me to Assisi with him because he had some friends there, and we stayed with them. And they were like, "Hey, you want to stay in Joseph Cupertino's bedroom?" I was like, "Yeah, that'd be cool." You were an archaeologist. Maybe I'll levitate. Know. What's that? You were an archaeologist. Yeah, okay. yeah. I cool. dug uh, at the Agora in Greece, okay. first century layer, which is exactly where uh, Saint Paul gave his talks. I got some soil from the first century layer. Wow. Uh, oh. And then I did a little bit of backfilling, really, mostly backfilling and surveying at the um, Temple of the Vestals in yeah. the Forum. I want to tell you about a course that I have created for men to overcome pornography. It is called strive21.com slash Matt. You go there right now, or if you text strive to 66866, we'll send you the link. It's 100% free. And it's a course I've created to help men, to give them the tools to overcome pornography. Usually men know that porn is wrong. They don't need me or you to convince them that it's wrong. What they need is a battle plan to get out. And so I've distilled all that I've learned over the last 15 or so years as I've been talking and writing on this topic into this one course. Think of it as if you and I could have a coffee over the next 21 days and I would kind of guide you along this journey. That's basically what this is. It's incredibly well produced. Uh, we had a whole camera crew come and film this. Um, um, and I think it'll be a really a real help to you. And it's also not an isolated course that you go through on your own because literally tens of thousands of men have now gone through this course. And as you go through the different videos, there's comments from men all around the world encouraging each other, offering to be each other's accountability partners and things like that. Strive21, that's strive21.com slash Matt, or as I say, text, text strive to 66866 to get started today. You won't regret it. All right, so we just took a break. The thing is, if we don't acknowledge that we just took a break mm. and we pr tried to stitch those two things together, it's just yeah. going to seem... People are going to wonder why we, were, why, why, we, why we both look like we've been crying. Yeah. We've been laughing so hard at jokes we cannot ever, retell. Ever, under any circumstances, <laughs> repeat. Can't even tell people where I heard them. Definitely not where I heard them. Do you like... Um, is hearing yes. confessions one of your oh. favorite things about being a priest? N I, you know, I'm glad you asked that. Are we, re are we recording? Yeah. Hearing confessions is the greatest disappointment of my priesthood. 
Okay, I thought, <laughs> I thought I was going to be witness to the secret inner lives of evil people. Yeah. I thought it was going to be so entertaining. It's just men being For like masturbated record, again. I have never heard it. Yes, it's yeah, like it's just boring. Oh my god! I mean, I I tell the kids this and they don't believe it. I've heard every sin, every sin. I can't imagine there are sins out there that I haven't heard yet, and none of them were interesting. Now. I do enjoy, especially when someone's like, <laughs> "Yeah, okay, okay, okay." And I go, "Porn?" Go, yeah. I go, "Yeah, you sick, horrible <laughs> human." No, of course, I like you and the rest of the world. Like, I, I love telling people, saying, "Look, it's over now. Get on with your life. Mm -hmm. Your sins are forgiven. Go be happy." Or, or, or even like, "Don't take yourself so seriously." You know, um, but. Uh, it not you know nothing more nothing. It was a it was a God, Saint Augustine who said that evil is just misdirect or a sin is just misdirected good. Evil is a vacuum. Yeah, and nothing proves that to me more than the, I, if the if someone came into confession was like. And then I crept up behind him with the knife, <laughs> and I lifted it around and stuck it to me. And I'd be like, "Yeah, oh, okay, well, that's kind of a cool story." But no, it's just like God. I killed this guy. And I feel horrible, and, uh, and you're like, "Okay, whatever." No, it, there, there's no, a joke. Whoa. I can speak of jokes. Yeah. Did you just? You, I feel like you made light of someone confessing murder. Yeah. Oh. Well, it's boring. Well, in retrospect, it's boring. Yeah. I mean, it, in fact, it's. It, there's nothing interesting even about a murder once you're sorry you when did When someone it. confesses murder, do you encourage them to um, do turn it. themselves in? <laughs> no, not do um, it again. I think that's what you were about to say. <laughs> yeah, well, it depends on who they murdered. No, um, <laughs> sorry. No, uh, no. But it would have... I, 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 don't, I don't really want to talk about All specific... Right. <laughs> Sorry, that's okay. But no, I, 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 I risk yeah, 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 violating yeah, 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 this. Yeah. I don't even want to come close. Yeah. There are two, you know, it's funny because there are two there are two jokes that were told to me when I was ordained that I think probably every priest hears. And the first is an urban myth that they they or it's not really a joke. It's sort of a story about one of our monks who, on the fiftieth anniversary of his ordination. He's with his brother priest, and they're smoking cigars. He's like, man, I'll tell you what. The very first confession I heard was the most vile, <laughs> horrifying experience of my life. <laughs> and then this little old lady walks up and says, you know, I was his first penitent. Yeah. <laughs> the, the idea being like, don't ever, ever talk I about it. Even 50 years later with yeah. a bunch of priests, don't talk about your confessions. Like, yeah. you know. And then the other one is... Um, a guy murders his wife, and he goes to a Lutheran pastor. He says, I've got a confession to make. I committed murder. And the Lutheran pastor says, okay, wait, hold on. All right, <laughs> sit down. Hold, let, let me, let me get my, make myself comfortable. In fact, I better go get a drink of water real quick, and I'll be right back. Well, by the time he comes back, the guy's gone, right? He goes, he finds an Anglican pastor. Mm -hmm. He says, okay, I committed murder. The Anglican pastor says, let me make us a pot of tea. We'll get down to the bottom of this. Finally, he just leaves. He finally finds a priest, Catholic priest. He says, Bless you, Father, I've seen that I committed murder. The priest says, How many times? <laughs> <laughs> right? And the idea being just that he, it's it's just mundane. Sin, sinning is not interesting. It, it's, or, or it's, well, like you said in your book on pornography, all, and I think this is true of all sin. Promises entertainment and delivers boredom. <clears throat> yeah, I really think I mean, even even I mean I don't know whatever you think you're gonna get out of it, it never yields what you think. Yeah, and and but I you imagine like, like, even though those sins that are being confessed once you've heard a million times before, mm -hmm. I mean the amount of comfort you're able to bring to a soul who comes that to confession, cool with, even yeah. with the most menial sins, uh, relatively speaking, you know. It's, I remember once I was speaking at a big conference and a young woman came up to me to tell me she's been struggling with pornography for years. She's never confessed it. And I was, you know, encouraged her and told yeah. her to get to confession. And, yeah. and she came the next day because it was a three-day conference and we were about to celebrate Holy Mass and she was beaming, you know. Yeah. And I just thought God has a special yeah. place for 
priests who are kind in the confession because it's even though for you it's humdrum f you know for a lot of people it's like i'm really afraid to do this yeah that that, to, I, that yeah. I like yeah i um uh, what's your yeah. favorite thing about being a priest then <clears throat> not confession obviously yeah, not not. Good. Well, I hate it. I, I, the single yeah, I, greatest. Discipline. I'm over. I'm over. I, I, admittedly, I was overstating it for the yeah. sake of entertainment. But, mm. um, I mean, I do. Okay, I find most entertaining is preaching. I love preaching. I really love preaching. But I have to say, making the creator of the cosmos incarnate between these four fingers is like mind blowing. I mean, I, and really I didn't, I, if anyone taught me this, it was Umar, right? I mean, who just could not believe that I would do such a thing to God, you know, I mean, that, that really is, I mean, I hate to say like the mass, but it's the mass, I mean, yeah. celebrating mass. Um, so I remember, I would think, uh, I would wonder how my experience of that would be different uh, to use by way of illustration. Uh, I would imagine that if I said to a priest, could you bless this rosary? And he went off into a room somewhere and shut the door and then came out and there was some blessing. I'd be like, Ooh, this is yeah. cool. But just to bless it in front of me, I'm like, I don't know if that counts. Is that even a yeah. thing? what just happened there? And I would imagine as a layman having this reverence for the Eucharist, but when it's knucklehead me doing it, I could see myself maybe doubting. Does that make sense? Like the Pope yeah. does it. You're like, oh, the, yeah. The day right. after, my, uh, when I finished my, saying my first Mass, afterwards I turned around to the <clears> priest <throat> and I was like, was that valid? Like, did I just do that? And I remember one of them was like, uh, I don't know, you were pretty <laughs> sloppy, but we were definitely on board, so it happened. <laughs> but um, speaking of which, I you mentioned my, or Gregory Pine mentioned my rosaries. Did he? And I made you a rosary, a That's hematite amazing. rosary, but I left it in the other room, Aww. so I'll have to get it later. <laughs> well, thank you anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but don't let me forget. All right. I also make my own patented, untested uh, ro humility rosary, which I make out of little skull's heads. I have a St. Benedict medal on one hand and a St. Benedict cross on the other, and it's Is ten it? little skulls that I say... Remember, man, you're dust to dust, you shall return. Remember, man, you're dust to dust. And I do, try to do that before I like give her treats and stuff mm. because, particularly, I think this is a temptation for youth ministers and people who work with young people is that you can, you, I mean, you can pretty much get them excited if you're clever enough and fun enough. And you can begin to think that that's you. And, I just before before I give her treats and things like that, I have to come face to face with that temptation and really definitively say this is not going to be about me, you know. And because party, and you, I only have my own stories to tell, right? So <clears throat> some of it's yeah. going to be about me. I think what I, I my you know my mother is just terrified that I'm going to become a celebrity priest. Yeah. Um. And and, and so am I. Yeah. I think. I mean. On the one hand, I really want people to buy my book, and I love talking to people. And you know, they've never asked you to speak at a Sikh conference, so I'm really disappointed in them, whoever mm -hmm, they are. Mm -hmm. He even blurred my book, Curtis, Mar no. Curtis Martin, if you're out there. You should be ashamed. Shame, shame, shame. But no, we'll see, that, okay, what I did right there was me. Yeah. It was all about me, and it, that is not appropriate, not attractive, not entertaining. And, and it can help anybody. And that's what I got to learn to avoid. I, I I saw an interview once. You know who Charles Bukowski is? He's one of the beat poets. He's probably the last one to die. He had this old one-eyed cat in the interview. He's like, you see this cat? This is me. This is me. You people, you got to me too late. I wrote all my good poetry already. You can't corrupt me. You know, I said, I think of myself and some one-eyed cat saying that to the devil you know you waited till i had parkinson's and was on my way out good yeah. <laughs> let's talk about fiction Ooh, okay but you need to I sit love, forward and put your hands oh, on the sorry, desk so, you don't, I know, uh, I know, so the camera okay. doesn't go in and out yeah um well actually like i was impressed i mean i did I, you gave me this book it's called the eighth arrow 
Oh and, yeah! Uh, please buy my book. Please read I, that book. I, I, I flipped, People are buying. It. I flipped it around and was impressed. You know. Thanks. You can get a sense from a couple of sentences here or there that are well <laughs> written. You know. Yeah. And the fact that you've got Pierce and um, O'Brien endorsing it, unless and know. the head of the Library of Congress said it was better than Tennyson, but he said that after it was published, so I couldn't put it on the book. Ah, I know. I said, "Can I quote you?" He said, "Yes." So, have you written fiction? Since you were young, or yeah, when I was little, I I, I wrote, uh, yeah, I, yeah, I, I, it's it's a way to escape, sort of. I, I'm in seventh grade. I wrote a story about kids who take over their seventh grade school and hold it hostage, and they send in the police, and they have rubber band guns and things. Hmm. I only wrote half of it, and then I charged all my friends to re for to to get the second half. So that was the first story oh, I nice. sold, and I I also sold a story to NPR about a little boy I found on the beach who drowned, named Jonathan Cross. This is a fiction. Story. Actually, that's a nonfiction. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh my gosh! Um, How did that happen? Well, uh, I, I I'm a little ADHD, in case you couldn't tell. <laughs> And so they always put me at the most dangerous beaches because oh, this is when you were off guard. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, oh, that's right. That's terrible. And so uh, yeah, there there's a in Galveston the beach is so gradual that when the tide goes out there are these big puddles okay. that leave, leave behind and they get stagnant over time and oh. they get a crust. This kid fell through the crust and drowned, and I was the first one to get to him. Um, so I wrote a, a, a story about that for NPR, and they read it years ago, called His Wide Mouth Home. Yeah. I still I still pray for that kid, cause, oh, I, but more so I pray for his parents, because yeah. I remember his mother holding his head and just, just I, mm. it, it haunts me, her screams. And, and the thought, yeah, I don't know why, but the, what, what bugged me afterwards was the thought of her in her wet swimsuit driving home, driving back to Houston. That's an hour and a half drive. And you with sand in your suit. Like, how do you do that? Like, how, I don't know. Um, was it just her and her son? Uh, I think her husband must have been there somewhere. I never, <clears> all <throat> I saw was her holding the kid and we did CPR. And no, it, I, I, I think I know what you mean. Cause it's like this peripheral Every mon everyday mundane things around a tragedy that break my heart the most. Mm. I remember the I think it was the was it Sandy Hook or there was a there was a school shooting around Christmas. Yeah, back in two thousand and I don't know twelve thirteen, and I um, yeah where, where I forget which one it was but um, I I remember the thing that broke my heart the most was that there would likely be presents stored away in advance for Christmas that oh. these parents would then have to do something with. And I yeah. don't know what it was about that peripheral, uh, yeah. you know, idea that. Or the image that always sticks in my head about nine eleven is all the shoes on the pavement. Yeah. People left behind, like the, the that someone put on those shoes this morning, and left them behind. You know. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Sandy Hook was December fourteenth. Oh, thank you. So fiction. Now you've taught. Oh, yeah. Sorry, we're going all over the place. But that's <laughs> yeah. okay. That's okay. Yeah, sorry. Um, are you writing any fiction now? Um, yes and no. I started writing. <laughs> like the world needs another one of these. My seventh graders asked me to write a zombie apocalypse. Oh. I, I much a, prefer that. I thought you were going to talk about a consecration to Mary. I'm like the world does oh, not no, need another no, one of those. No, no. I don't but need the one zombie those. one, I'm open to. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I, I, I would if they, if every kid in the class <clears> made a hundred <throat> on their quiz, then I would write another chapter of the zombie apocalypse. Excellent. Um, so it starts with Humanae Mortuoris or something like that. The the papal encyclical declaring that they have no souls that you can kill them. Okay. And then it follows this kid. On his way, he joins a monast a Trappist monastery yeah. on an island that survived. I don't know. Who I, don't, I don't know. Oh, I do know where it's going because in the last chapter I just wrote, I'll never finish it. The world doesn't need another zombie apocalypse. But um, he, they they're about to kill the zombie when the zombie says, "Hey, wait, hold on!" And then all of a sudden they realize it's got a soul, and now they got to make their way to Rome to tell the Pope that. 
we can't kill them anymore. Mm. I don't know. But we'll see. I I really doubt there's any future in another zombie apocalypse. But we'll see. I like writing bad short stories because they're easier, maybe. Yeah, it'd just be fun. Because a short story, you can come up with a specific idea that intrigues you, scares you, something like that. And then having that as the climax and building up to that is fun. Yeah. Especially when you're flowing. That's a great state. Have you published the whale one yet? Yeah, I, 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 it was a self-published <laughs> book. None of them are good. I'll give, I'll give you a book on the way. Oh yeah, I'll give you one before. But that you was leave. part of the podcast, right? Yeah. So what I did is I, we wrote these stories, and then we either, you either I read them, yeah, or we paid someone to read them. But then we published them in a book. That's great. It's fun. Yeah. But, but that idea that we 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 touched on earlier, that that the I think it was. Um, King, Stephen King, who said mm. there's a fine line between horror and comedy. Yeah. I like that a lot. I'd like to think about why I like that. Well, there's there's one there there are various theories about why f- things are funny. And I know one of them is called something like Oh no, I can't remember what it's called, but the the idea being that your brain has to process opposing emotions simultaneously. Yeah. yeah. Confusion resolution theory, I think is what it's called. Yeah. That like you say, two fish are driving a tank. Or no, <laughs> darn it. I just... I well, just here's, totally an, here's another one. Two what? fish in a okay. tank and yeah. the one says, how do you drive this thing? Like, go ahead. But what was your joke? Well, I mean, you just... We won't say the joke, but the, the idea about the man who came into the doctor's office. <laughs> oh! Right? It's the expectation yes. that was thwarted at the end. Do you think yeah, that's what it was? Yeah, don't retell yeah. that joke. Well, tell me about but this yeah. one. Why couldn't Fred ride a bike? Because well, he was a fish. Is that anything? Yeah, no, but it's it's you're you're like wait what? Yeah. Yes, wait. Oh, oh, yeah. There's that thing, and that's funny. But I, I think know. for me, and I don't know what makes something funny, but I think that strangeness uh, is that line between humor and, and timing. horror and timing. Yeah, <laughs> but strange. That was a joke, by the way. Yeah, yeah. It's just as a, as a, as a, as a, as a, never mind. Which is yeah. why I've always liked things like. The Twilight Zone, like that kind of horror. Yeah, which are almost always kind of funny in a dark way, aren't they? I remember, they? I don't like Stephen King. Every time I read him, I, I'm reminded that I shouldn't have bought that book. Yeah. But I was reading a bunch of his short stories, and if memory serves, forgive me, I'm going to mess this up. But the, This fella, I guess, wakes up, some sort of apocalypse has taken place, and he goes up to a car, and the car bites his arm off. And it was like, what the heck does that even mean? Yeah. I don't know if he went to refuel or something and it grabbed onto his arm and ate it. Okay. I'm not even saying it was good, but there was just something so yeah. unbelievably jarring about that that I thought maybe that's what it, like, it's almost funny, I guess. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, he wrote a great book on writing, by the way. I heard that, yeah. Yeah, he, and re- near the beginning, he says something like that he, he started writing... In front at a desk in the basement that had two nails sticking out of the wall, and every time he get a rejection letter, he put it on that nail, and he swore to himself that he wouldn't stop submitting until he had filled up that first nail. He says, and I was halfway through the second <clears throat> nail when my first acceptance came in. Yeah. How interesting! Yeah, yeah. yeah. which uh, is deeply comforting to me. <laughs> yeah. I because mean, it took me 14 years to write that novel, and you began was, it 14 years ago, or the idea started to percolate. Oh no, I, I it, it actually started off as a post-apocalyptic story about a kid with guns that pop out of his arms. Yeah, and it evolved into Odysseus in Dante's Inferno. Don't know, I don't even know how that happened, but at year like 12 or so, I was telling you this story, but I might as well repeat it. That uh, I was. I'm pretty good friend, or I was pretty good friends. COVID kind of ended that with um, Philip Pullman, who writes books for atheist children. And I told, I confessed to him over dinner. I Golden said, "Golden Compass." That's the most yeah, popular. Yeah, yeah. The HBO did a, a series. Um, it's not nearly as anti-Catholic as you would think. Actually, I, I, I think he actually fails. <laughs> spectacularly in creating a deeply pious book but yeah. anyway that's just me i wouldn't i wouldn't recommend it for kids unless they have a very solid theology behind them um but then again there's a lot of bad fantasy in the world and i would rather read pullman than another one of these watered down tolkens where yeah 
Olgar, the dwarf of the seven hills of Uthar, with the crystal sword of the elves of the woods of Morbloth. You know where? <laughs> and he, uh, yeah. Pullman Pullman reimagines Milton's Paradise Lost, but the angels are coming back, and this time they're going to do God in right, which <laughs> all kinds of theological problems, but. It's real. The, the literature, he's, he knows how to, the man knows how to really write. And I'd rather that, I'd ra I think bad art is worse for the soul than bad theology. I could be wrong. That's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, there's no way that's well, true. But, well, yeah, I think so because bad theology isn't convincing, but bad art well, can yeah. hook you. Art, culture, yeah, these I mean, things that win our affections. Right. I and mean, I could, you can, well, how did, how did this whole LGBT thing happen? Through art, right? Not through argumentation. We just saw Pro enough propaganda, television shows. I guess you could call that art. Right. Yeah. Maybe. Well, I mean, I, you know, it's, um, yeah. A snowballing of bad ideas, I think. But it wasn't the bad ideas themselves. It wasn't I people think it reading. Was art. I think it was art. I think it was just seeing enough craziness on television until pretty soon you started to think it was normal oh i see yeah you kind of get bombarded by these well because when, when they were trying to push sodomy and and on us it was a bunch mm -hmm. of gay characters that we felt affection for. yeah yeah and now they're and, trying to and, push trans on us which i don't yeah. think they're going to be able to pull off but the same thing's happening now you got to have the the poor little trans character who you begin to feel sorry for yeah. and I gotta tell you guys about my new favorite app. It's called Ascension and it's by Ascension Press. This is the number one Bible study app, in my opinion. And uh, you can go to ascensionpress.com slash frad, go there, uh, and so that way they know that we sent you. It is absolutely fantastic. It has the entire Bible there, very well laid out. The, the whole Bible is read to you by Father Mike Schmidt, so just sections of the Bible. It has the catechism there. It's cross-referenced absolutely beautifully. It's really actually quite difficult to explain to you how good this is. Just download it and check it out for yourself. It even has over 1,600 frequently asked questions about scripture. So if you go to Genesis 1, you might have a question about evolution. Well, there's a drop down right there. You can read an article that'll help you understand it. Um, I went through it with the guys at Ascension the other day and my mouth, my jaw was just, it, had, it was dropped. It, it was absolutely amazing. Um, it's had tens of thousands of five-star reviews. Again, go to ascensionpress.com slash frad. It also has all of their amazing Bible studies. So I remember back in the day I had a big DVD case of Jeff Caven's Bible studies. Well, it's all there on the app. So go download it right now. Please go to ascensionpress.com slash frad. Uh -huh. But I just finished giving a retreat to the retired priests of the Diocese of St. Louis, right? Mm -hmm. And they were great. They're so, they, I've never heard worse hymns <laughs> sung with more holiness in my <laughs> life. Like yeah. they, they were just belting out these atrocious liturgies um, in, in, in a way that I thought was just thrilling, really, frankly. Um, and um, so I decided for my pen, penultimate conference with them. I really took a chance. We have um, these incredible vestments at the monastery, fiddlebacks mm -hmm. that have been woven in gold by a friend of our monastery who we all call Biker Bob because he's a biker and his name is Bob. Mm. Long story there. But anyway, point is he makes these intricate gold woven fiddlebacks. So I brought one of them with me. I said, I'm not going to give you any introduction. I'm just going to do this and we're going to see what happens. I said, how does... This make you feel. And you say that to who? The the sixty five or oh, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> What did they say? Well, the mood went south real quick. They weren't angry at me, okay, because we had already established that I was yeah. on their side, right? But one of them raised his hand. He said, "You know what that tells me? That tells me you want to reverse everything I've done for the last fifty years of my life." Yeah. Um, well, depending on what they did, the answer would be yes. Well, yeah. I'm open to well, it being yes. No, because I mean, I, one thing I said to him was, look, you guys kept the flame alive. Without you, we would have no church, right? You're, you're here. And, and, and you guys kept your vocations when everyone else was leaving, right? So I think everybody here right. should be canonized, period, <laughs> just for making it through yeah. the last 20 years. Um, 
But yeah, yeah, there are some things I want to reverse. That's so funny that you just whipped it out. How does it? What was the point of asking them that? Well, because well, because we're having this debate in my own my own community, and and I wanted to under yeah. It's so easy for me to yell at my elders and tell them they're wrong, and and they. <laughs> at lunch, we had one of these arguments, and our old abbot Patrick finally slammed his hand on the table. And he said. We created a desert. Don't you blame them for seeking water? Mm. I thought, oh my god! I, but but part of me wants to say, yeah, yeah, take that, you know, mm. and get really worked up because we've. I St. Louis Abbey has lost vocations because of our liturgy. Sometimes, sometimes, um, maybe I think. I don't know. I gotta be careful because I, I, I don't want to disrespect my elders. We could speak generally though about but, the vocations yeah. lost because of the abuses in the liturgy. Yeah, but okay. So what was the, the question? Was why did I show? Because I want to know. I, the thing is, as far as I'm concerned, this just looks cool. It has nothing to do with ideology. It's, I just I will say a mariachi mass. If you if you get me a really no, great mariachi won't. band, no, no, probably no. not. But I, I I might try. Yeah, well. I mean, I've said life teen masses that I thought were not great liturgical expressions of Catholic identity, and I found them thrilling in some respects. Um, but the point of showing the fiddle back was to try to understand. To well, to sh well, I don't <laughs> actually. To be honest, I don't know why I did it. <laughs> um, I think I it was more. I said it was more for me than for them. To be honest. Mm. Um, well, no. <laughs> okay, this is a long-form discussion, right? So I don't have to have my ideas fully calibrated, right? But um, the thing was, I really liked these old guys, all right? And I appreciate what they've done with their lives. I really do. Um, but I also really, really want to move forward now. And I've got my own way of doing things that hurts their feelings. Mm. And I wanted to show them that it was not my intention to hurt their feelings or to undo their work. Mm. But it was my intention to move forward. So I wanted them to hear that. But I also wanted to hear from them why this was the case. Because like, for example, I took the same vestments with me. To, sorry, I'm getting excited here. But I took the same vestments with me to Houston, Texas. I did a thing with uh, St. Thomas High School down Just there. Just come in a bit more. Oh, sorry. Yeah, so, no, I'm getting been, excited. I'm getting distracted. St. Thomas High School, yeah. Yeah, they're a really neat group of kids. Um, and and I brought my fiddleback set, uh -huh. and they thought it was really cool. They thought it looked like armor. Yeah. But my parish priest, great man named Paul Hovenitz. Shout out to Father Paul Hovenitz. I, I showed it to him, and he said, ugh. I said, why? Like, what? Like, I love you. You love me. I respect you. I he, This guy's got great, but, but for some reason, it represents just the cut of cloth. Repre like, will evoke these deep emotions of repulsion that I can't even, I, I don't know. I don't know where it comes from. I don't know why, why this is. And you're genuinely seeking to understand. Yeah, it. yeah. yeah. I mean, that, that, that's why I showed it because I, I mean, I was hoping for. A, I actually, I was hoping for something a little deeper than this. Just enrages me because of what it makes me think you feel. But I, I mean, I can imagine. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, I'd hope to. I, I was kind of hoping it would give me some insight to and maybe what? give me a way to approach it with my own elders. Yeah. You know? I was chatting with an older priest um, at a particular diocesan center. He helps train seminaries. I won't say where. But it was interesting just chatting with him. He did not understand young Catholics, I think, today. He didn't understand why people would want mm -hmm. incense, why they would want <laughs> Latin, why they would want, I would call it, beauty. And so it, yeah. was, it was nice just to talk to him and try to understand what he's saying. Well, what did he say? What, what was his I rationale? I think it's the old young people are just interested in the externals and they want to dress up and play dress up, that kind of stuff. Or even Benedict's um, uh, modifications to the Novus Ordo, 
he thought was insane. And he yeah. actually said to me, Charles. no young person is interested in Latin. Yeah. And I went, oh, 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 oh buddy. Oh, oh. <laughs> yeah, I, I, well, I, I. We're interested in reclaiming a culture that was stripped from us, that we were, didn't even have, we wasn't even given to us. Here's the thing though. Well, practically speaking, if you want the church to survive, we're going to have to embrace traditional forms of worship. I'm sorry. I, I, you know, I, I was listening to your um, podcast I, mm. with Gomer, Gomer and, and I went and I wrote my Fratifesto, which, which my friend pointed out should be named the Matifesto. I still want to see this at some yeah. point. Yeah. Well, I, I'm... <laughs> Maybe you, I can, you can send it to me. We'll, we'll publish I'll it. I'll send on it to you, and you can bonus. decide what you think. But the point is, like, it, unless like things like altar rails and communion on the tongue, yes, and uh, beautiful vestments and and Latin in the liturgy, all these things remind us that we're part of something bigger and older and nobler. Yes, than us. But for some, for a certain generation, it reminds them, I think, of cruel, arrogant. It also might, the anger also might be coming from the fact that they fought the wrong fight and yeah. that they had to invest in something that was false. And now yeah. they're realizing at the end of their life what a mistake it was. But, yeah. Well, no, but see, that that's the thing. Like, my friend Father Paul, he runs a fantastic parish with yeah. pretty di pretty traditional liturgy, yeah. and um, and even he gets put off by this stuff, and I, I can't figure it out. But I do know that if we want vocations at St. Louis Abbey, we're going to have to make certain adjustments. Yeah. <laughs> or continue to. We, we just adopted Latin Vespers as a community, but... It was hard on the older guys, I think. Yeah, and bless you for being concerned with them. And I think we should be concerned with people because this, just like people who were raised in the Tridentine Mass and had that robbed from them, were like yeah. disorientate. What the heck did you just do? Yeah. I think if we're going to see some some big changes in the church, we're going to need it to be maybe incremental because to rip the current liturgy away from those who grew up with it is to rip away their tradition. Right, right. And maybe that'll feel just as violent. Right. I think what happened with some religious communities is that they say, well, this is all so beautiful, but this is what Mother Church wants of us. We have to do this. In fact, I know a nun who I was good friends with died not too long ago, so I can tell her story, but she said to herself, I love my habit. I want to wear my habit, but Mother Church needs this from me now. Yeah, she was probably wrong. I, I think she was. Yeah. But she then spent, she actually kept her, her habit in a drawer and would okay. take it out and look at it every now and then. Oh. I know. But, but I, I think that what happened was she spent the next 50 years saying, that was not a mistake. It wasn't a mistake. This is what the church asks of us. This was not. So then all of a sudden all these young women show yeah, up and, and they want to join these traditional. And, and she says, nope. Mm-mm. I think it's uh, to, no. another analogy is like the woman who bought the feminist lie and went into the workforce and sent her kids to daycare her whole life, told taught their whole lives, telling them that was the best thing. And now she's seeing these up young, young women who are like, I actually want to be in the house. I love yeah. my children. No, I love you serving don't, my after husband. I give up all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. Maybe it's something like that. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. We're not going to sort it out today. Yeah, we are. Are we? Okay. Let's give but it another you, tip in. We do have a flight to catch, so we should probably wrap up. I'm really enjoying this. It was nice to meet you. Yeah. It was yeah. nice to talk to you. I'm glad you exist. Are you going to come visit us in St. Louis sometime? Yeah, if I come, I'd like to. All right. I'll be at Seek, actually, next year. I'll see you so, in January? Yeah. I'll see you there. I'll give you my number. We could <laughs> maybe text if when you're there. It'd be good to hang out. I'll say WTF, BFF. LOL. <laughs> That's exactly that how way, I speak. That people have well, I am a boomer, so yes, apparently that is how I speak. <laughs> hey, these books are terrific. Um, oh, do cool. you have a website that people can go to just to get them, or do they just type your name into Amazon? I or? do. You can, on Amazon, I have a web, an author website. The easiest way is just to Google Surfing Monk. Surfing the, Monk, okay. Yeah, the first thing that will come up is basically a videotape of me being eaten by a shark. Oh. Yeah, a news article. Surfing monk nearly eaten by shark. Okay. Yeah. And then underneath it is usually my website. So, but 
uh, yeah, Father, there's only one Augustine Weta in the world, so beautiful. Just Google that. Thank well, you so much for you. having me. I uh, I hope I didn't say anything heretical or 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 cruel or insensitive. I'm I worry about these things sometimes when I speak off the cuff. This is why I always write it. I write out all my sermons word for word, precisely because. Did you already stop? No. Oh, okay. okay. Sorry, I thought he had stopped. Oh, okay. But anyway. I think but, you did fantastic. So. Well, thank you. Uh, yeah. No, these 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 things always make everybody feel uncomfortable. And I'll tell you I'll tell you why. Maybe we'll wrap up on this, you know. Like so 20 years ago, if a Catholic radio station was to ask you to speak on a particular topic, you you may have had 5 minutes, you may have had 20 minutes, right? Yeah. But you had a perfectly crafted soundbite and it was really and it actually was perfectly crafted. It was an excellent way of yeah. saying something. Whereas I feel like the new media which YouTube affords enables us to try to think through things and yeah. I don't I think we should ever try to nail what somebody has said in a in a YouTube video or a podcast down as their conclusive opinion because part of why people love listening to these podcasts is yeah. they're listening to people <laughs> fumble around trying to grasp at something. Well, make no yeah. mistake about it. I I'm fumbling. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I which could be why, wrong about everything. I which said might be in part well, why everything. we why we prefer to <laughs> listen to this podcast, say, or some other podcast, sometimes more than an audio book. Right, the audio book yeah. is the crystallized thoughts, but there's something about people wrestling with it, and the invitation is to have people wrestle along with us, and I'm sure they'll give us their conclusion below. <laughs> well, thank you for letting me wrestle with yeah. you. I appreciate it. Thanks. What a great what a treasure, and may God bless you and all the work you do here. Thanks. Mm-hmm. <laughs>